order. Before we be before we began, I uh, I now I know I speak for everyone here when I wish our ranking member a belated happy birthday yesterday, and um, we're supposed to have some cake later, so I don't have want to celebrate. A vote on that. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, late happy birthday. Um, we appreciate serving with you, sir. Um, thank you, Commissioner Werfel, um, for appearing before the Ways and Means Committee a little earlier than usual this year. We have a lot to go over with you, so I appreciate you answering the request of our members to come before the committee early this year. First, as it pertains to the current 2023 tax filing season, I want to thank you and your team for the technical work to ensure the quick and without delay implementations of provisions of the Tax Relief for American Families and Workers Act. We particularly appreciate the steps the agency is taking right now to be ready to immediately implement the legislation once the Senate passes the bill and it is signed into law, especially with regard to adjustments to the child tax credit. I think we are also largely aligned on the importance of rooting out fraud in the employee retention tax credit program. We look forward to hearing about your efforts, not just in eliminating that fraud, but also making sure that small businesses across America who filed legitimate claims receive their credits as soon as possible. While I'm grateful for your partnership in these efforts, it won't surprise you that I also have a number of concerns about the Biden administration's approach to the IRS and about the IRS's handling of several important issues. Last time you were before this committee, the IRS had chosen to delay a provision of a law crafted by the Biden administration and congressional Democrats that would send tax forms to 44 million Americans just for engaging in transactions over $600 in a year. This includes transactions like simply selling a used couch or a concert ticket through a third-party payment platform. Once again, the IRS unilaterally chose to delay implementing the law or sending these forms, this time in an election year. To be clear, Republicans are united behind repealing this terrible policy and I want to thank Representative Carol Miller for her leadership on the repeal effort. But the way to fix this terrible law is to repeal it, not to use the IRS to shield the Biden administration from the consequences of its own policies. Also, last time you were before this committee, you said the IRS would not retaliate against whistleblowers. One of the IRS whistleblowers who has appeared before this committee has since alleged the IRS retaliated against him for exposing the truth about the DOJ's preferential treatment of Hunter Biden. I hope you will share what steps have been taken to protect whistleblowers. And just a couple weeks ago, a judge sentenced an IRS contractor to five years in prison for the greatest theft of taxpayer information in American history. I think the Department of Justice woefully, woefully undercharged this individual, but I'm pleased the judge applied the maximum sentence available to her. But this story doesn't end with that case. The IRS must be accountable for allowing this theft to have ever happened and must ensure that it fixes security vulnerabilities at the agency. A recent report from the Inspector General described alarming details about how current IRS security flaws that demonstrate the problem has not and has not been resolved. I hope that you will commit today to address their findings quickly for the sake of millions of taxpayers. We have serious questions about numerous other issues, such as the implementation of an IRS direct file scheme that the American people didn't ask for, how the IRS is spending its windfall of $80 billion, and fantasy land claims about how much revenue the agency thinks it will generate from increased audits. 
Frankly, more of the IRS's time and resources should be directed toward improving its customer service for its existing duties, not spending money and resources on new systems no one has asked for. Part of that focus should be on deploying new technology to make the IRS more efficient. Proper use of technology can help avoid the need to hire thousands and thousands of new employees. I want to thank Representative Schweikert for leading the charge to ensure that the IRS is taking advantage of new technology to help taxpayers. Clearly, there is a lot the IRS needs to answer for, and I look forward to hearing how your agency plans to follow the law and protect taxpayers moving forward. I'm pleased to recognize Ranking Member Nill for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman. So we want to welcome the Commissioner back to the Committee on Ways and Means. As always, it's uh, delightful to have you with us in the middle of what promises to be another record-breaking filing season. The dedication of the employees of the Internal Revenue Service is remarkable. We want to thank them for their commitment to our taxpayers and fair tax administration, emphasis on the word fair, and for the swift implementation of the Inflation Reduction Act. Last filing season was the first impacted by the Democrats' multi-year investment from this historic legislation. While taxpayer service was dramatically improved, it was merely the consequence of a well-laid, well-funded plan. The results have been quite remarkable. In this era of service to America's taxpayers, the IRS beat Secretary Yellen's goal and delivered it an 87 percent quality level of service. Three million more phone calls were answered, while wait times were cut from 28 minutes to three minutes. Over 140,000 additional taxpayers were served in person. The 222 backlog was eliminated, and many new digital tools were introduced to make taxpayer experiences even easier. A reminder to our Republican colleagues, many of the recommendations that we entertain and discuss this morning came from Commissioner Reddick, a Republican who worked with all of us to ensure quality service. We know that expectations have been increased based on the success that the IRS has had so far. It was just last year that we discussed the future of the IRS ability to hold the top 1 percent of tax cheats accountable. And in a matter of months, over $500 million has been recovered from 1,600 wealthy tax avoiders. Another major victory is taxpayer fairness and a victory for the IRS. A reminder, if the revenue is not collected in a fair manner, that means the rest of us pay more. Yet the biggest threat to the IRS right now is the extremism of some of our colleagues. From the government shutdown that looms in just five legislative days to our colleagues' attempt to gut our investments every chance they've gotten, not only would this end up costing taxpayers money and adding to the deficit, but how can you argue with the success? I find myself wondering out loud about who wins when the IRS is starved for its resources. Perhaps our colleagues will have a chance to answer that this morning. Under Republican funding cuts, the audit rate on millionaires fell by more than 70 percent from 2010 to 2019. Those are numbers from Commissioner Reddick. And the audit rate on large corporations fell by more than 50 percent. That was a request from Commissioner Reddick. Workers and their families pay their fair share, and the American people can count on us to ensure that wealthy and well-connected people are paying their fair share, too. While the promise of direct file draws near, and I'm optimistic about some prospects, I'm disappointed it wasn't already in time for the public to take advantage of it. We want to thank the Commissioner for his diligence being here today. We look forward to continue work on behalf of the American people. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Member Neal. Today's sole witness is the Commissioner of the Internal Revenue Service, Daniel Werfel. The Committee has received your written statement, and it will be made part of the formal hearing record. Commissioner Werfel, you may begin when you are ready. Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Neal, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify on the filing season and IRS operations. I am pleased to report that the 2024 filing season opened on schedule on January 29th and has gone smoothly so far. Along with filing season and other day-to-day -day operations, we continue to make important progress in our efforts to transform our agency through implementation of the Inflation Reduction Act. Using IRA funding, 
our work is centered on three fundamental themes. First, ensuring taxpayers can easily contact the IRS, whether in person, on the phone, or online. We want them to get help navigating complex tax laws and accessing the credits they deserve. Second, identifying the growing number of taxpayers with complex returns, including certain wealthy individuals, large corporations, and complex partnerships who are shielding income to evade their tax responsibility. We wanna collect from them what is owed. And third, addressing the growing risk of tax scams and schemes by protecting honest taxpayers from them. We wanna root out the nefarious actors that perpetrate them. These investments allow us to strengthen the overall effectiveness of IRS operations. As commissioner, I want people to know that the IRS is on the side of taxpayers, and we are working to reflect that in every aspect of our operations while administering the nation's tax law. The IRS has been working hard to build on the accomplishments of last year. Our transformation goals for this filing season include providing an 85% level of service on our main toll-free phone line during the filing season. On the compliance side, we continue to increase scrutiny on those who evade taxes. We are working to reverse the historically low audit rates for large corporations, complex partnerships, and high wealth individuals. During the past year, the IRS has also taken dramatic steps to strengthen our internal systems, protocols, and procedures by putting in place numerous improvements to bolster how we protect key systems and information. Our recent steps, enabled with new funding, have sharply reduced risks for taxpayers and the tax system. While taxpayers should rightfully be concerned about recent reports of the unauthorized access and disclosure that occurred in the 2017 to 2021 timeframe, the data security environment at the IRS is dramatically improved today. We have worked tirelessly this past year to close gaps that allow this unfortunate event to transpire. However, there is always more work to do in this area and we will continue our laser focus on strengthening data security. Another important aspect of our mission is implementing the tax laws fairly and justly. A key part of this involves making sure everyone pays the taxes they owe. But we also have a responsibility to protect taxpayers from being overly burdened in fulfilling their tax obligations. We work continuously to balance these two sides of the mission. This is the issue we faced in implementing the $600 threshold for 1099K reporting that Congress passed in 2021. While it is important for us to have the information provided under the lower threshold, we must also consider the burden placed on taxpayers in meeting this requirement. Our administration of tax laws should be guided by what is best for taxpayers. In this situation, we delayed imposing the lower threshold because we realized that immediate implementation posed a high risk of taxpayers being confused and given the complexities of the 1099 reporting, some potentially paying taxes they didn't actually owe. That is something we take very seriously and we will do everything in our power to avoid. So the IRS is continuing to work to reduce that risk before imposing the $600 standard for business transactions. We will continue working this and getting feedback from key groups. I also want to assure the committee that the IRS is paying close attention to the potential passage of the child tax credit legislation. If Congress acts, the IRS is poised to move quickly to implement it. Building off our experience with economic impact payments during the pandemic, we may be able to start implementation as early to, as six to 12 weeks after passage, depending on the bill's final language. But taxpayers should not wait for this legislation to file their returns. We will take care of getting any additional refunds to taxpayers who have already filed. They won't need to take additional steps. Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Neal, and members of the committee, that concludes my statement. I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. We'll now proceed to the question and answer session. Commissioner Werfel, as you know, the House passed the Tax Relief for American Families and Workers Act. 
included adjustments to child tax credit. You just briefly touched on that. I want to ask some, um, some, some additional questions to, to make the record reflect appropriately. But the bill passed through this committee by a vote of 40 to 3, and it received 357 votes on the House floor. As I mentioned in my opening statement, I appreciate the work your, you and your team have done to help ensure that the bill can be implemented as quickly as possible. I just want to confirm a few details with you. The overwhelming majority of American taxpayers are guaranteed to have no adjustment to their tax liability due to the child tax credit changes in this bill. In fact, can you confirm that only roughly 10% of households will be effective and will receive just modest adjustments to their tax refunds? Yes, in fact, in looking at the numbers, if you look at the same uh, eligible population uh, in fiscal year 22, it was about 22 and a half million people. So that, that metric that you offered is in line with our understanding of how it's gonna impact taxpayers going forward. Thank you. We worked with your team to make sure the bill did not place a new burden on taxpayers and can be implemented without delay. Can you confirm that taxpayers do not need to file amended returns to obtain the adjustments the bill makes, further speeding things up? Yes. Thank you. There is language in the legislation requiring the IRS to process any additional returns without delay. As a matter of fact, that was language we added during the markup in this room. If the bill is passed by the Senate and signed into law, how quickly will you be able to make the child tax credit adjustments for this filing season? In other words, how long will it take after bill signage for the IRS to send out any additional refunds? Well, we gave you a range of six to 12 weeks uh, required for implementation from the point of enactment. The reason we give a range is because we uh, need to see the final language but I'm committed to work diligently to make sure we're closer to the six week end of that range than the 12 week. I, I appreciate hearing that, Commissioner. Um, so just to be clear, we have your commitment um, that the IRS will move as quickly as possible. It will be, a, it will be a, a top priority to make sure that this gets done. Thank you, sir. In the past, Congress has asked the IRS to make changes during tax filing season. In fact, Congress has asked the IRS to make much larger changes than this bill does, like sending stimulus checks to hundreds of millions of taxpayers, or creating a monthly check sending system for the child tax credit on, on the fly. The number of taxpayers affected here is a fraction of those affected in those other programs. Given that, can you confirm the administrative adjustments needed to implement the Tax Relief for American Families and Workers Act are a much lighter lift for the IRS than for those other programs. Yes, and Mr. Chairman, the work that we did to implement uh, the uh, payments that you referred allowed us to build additional capacity to make us even more ready for this change. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Werfel, the individual who stole and disclose the tax information of thousands of Americans has now been punished with a sentence of five years in prison. While I'm glad the judge in the case sentenced him to the maximum available to her, I was surprised that the Department of Justice only charged the individual with one count, one count of unauthorized disclosure and no other crimes. Did you make a recommendation to the Department of Justice on how to charge in this case? No, that's not the role of the IRS commissioner. We allow and, and defer to the De Department of Justice on prosecutorial decisions. Do you think one count of disclosure matches the crime committed? I think that protecting taxpayer information from unauthorized access is an absolute solemn responsibility of the IRS. And I also believe that this individual betrayed the trust, he betrayed his own uh, commitments, he betrayed IRS employees, and he betrayed the American tax people. And based, and, and that type of betrayal should not be tolerated, and based on what's playing out in court, it's not being tolerated because this person is being brought to justice, and as I understand it, is gonna spend years in prison. Five years. Um, do you think the, the penalty should have been higher for this individual? 
I don't, I don't have a judgment on that, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I rely on the court and the judicial process to play out, and I trust that the judicial process will uh, get the right answer. I was looking at more of the legislative process of whether Congress should change and increase the penalties for someone who abuses taxpayer information like this situation. I now recognize the ranking member for any questions he might have. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Commissioner, what's the IRS done to restore an element of fairness to the tax system? And are there any new compliance push that you are aware of to audit high-income earners and big corporations? Yeah, thank you for the question. See, what happened in the period before the Inflation Reduction Act, when IRS funding was, was low and we weren't making the appropriate investments, is there's a variety of different areas we fell behind. And one of the key areas we fell behind is the ability to assess complex returns. So in situations where taxpayers had the means to hire an army of lawyers or an accountants to create a lot of complexity in their return and potentially shield income, we weren't making the appropriate investments to track that, assess it, and collect it. And now we are doing just that. With the Inflation Reduction Act resources, we are focused on building our capacity around how to deal with complex returns and how to make sure there's fairness. Because if you're a taxpayer who can't afford to hire a lawyer or an accountant to help you create complexity and shield your income, then you would likely be very frustrated if those that did have the resources could do that and evade what they owe. And we have to close that gap, and we're making really important progress uh, already in closing that gap. Thanks. And, and Commissioner, let's talk about data security. I thought your answer and your introductory comments was uh, on, on target. You want to talk about data security and the improvements that have been made in your time as Commissioner? Yeah, I mentioned how important uh, in the answer to Mr. Chairman's question, data security is to the IRS. It is fundamental to what we do in ensuring the public trust. When I got to the IRS, one of the first things I did in March of 2023 was pull the team in together and ask, what is the state of our data security environment? And what I learned was there were a lot of gaps. And one of the primary causes of those gaps was lack of investment. The underfunding that had occurred for many years at the IRS, I said, decreased our capacity in a variety of different ways. And one of those ways was to keep pace with investing in the type of technology, mm -hmm. process change, controls to make sure that our environment was, uh, was secure. And we have spent the last year working diligently to close those gaps. And there is a long laundry list of steps we have taken to completely dramatically change our environment. And I'll point out one important one. Um, the Inspector General, in evaluating our security environment, pointed specifically to a lack of audit trails in our system so that we can see how data is moving throughout the organization and we can track and see if it's moving in an inappropriate way. I required, and it's now been implemented, that every sensitive system in the IRS has the very robust audit trails that the Inspector General required. Again, before the Inflation Reduction Act, we didn't have the resources to put in the work to close these gaps. And that's why it is so important that the IRS be funded adequately for its operations, not just so that we can answer the phone when people call us, not so that we can keep pace with complex returns, but we need to invest in our infrastructure and invest in our data security. So events like what happened in 2017 to 2020, that that doesn't happen again. Yeah, I don't understand the logic that sometimes is offered that if we cut the IRS, then somehow we're going to improve compliance. The logic escapes me. So let me give you some time here. You've got a minute and 15 seconds to talk about some of the other additions to your testimony that you might like to offer. Absolutely. So I, I really want to amplify this, this point about what a, uh, a funded IRS mean versus what it doesn't. And we have all the evidence we need in looking at the state of the IRS before the Inflation Reduction Act was passed versus where it is today. And before the Inflation Reduction Act was passed, our walk-in centers around the country were closed or understaffed with lines around the block. 
And now, just a few years later, we've opened 50 new walk-in centers. They're fully staffed. We're extending hours to Saturday for people who can't get to us during the week. And we're implementing what we call pop-up walk-in centers going to remote populations. So if people want to see us in person, they now can. A second example is with the phones. We were understaffed by thousands of phone assisters because of underfunding. What did we do with the funding? We hired 5,000 phone assisters, put them in the call center, and between before the Inflation Reduction Act and after, there was a dramatic change in our ability to answer the phone and help taxpayers with their questions. And the same is true for digital. We have a a whole generation of taxpayers that is going to expect, as they should, to be able to do everything they ever wanted to do with the IRS without calling us, without going into our walk-in centers. And before we were funded, our technology tools were stagnant. They weren't being updated in the way you would see either other tax jurisdictions around the world or in the financial services sector and the retail sector. That's all changing now. We have work to do, but now every time taxpayers come to to be with the IRS and filling out their taxes or, or answering a question, when they go to our website each filing season, they're gonna see a new set of tools, new functionality, new things that they can do without ever calling us or walking into a walk-in center because we're investing and focusing our investments on how do we best serve taxpayers. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Buchanan's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanna thank the commissioner for being here today. Uh, I chaired the Florida Chamber. We had 130 business, 30,000 businesses in the Federation across Florida. But one of the biggest issues, and I mentioned this to you a little bit earlier, is dispute resolution. And I'm talking about companies with 50 employees or less. The cost of hiring accountants and maybe you have to get an attorney and go through that whole process is very time consuming. Many times we'll put them out of business, some of them. But I think it's got a little bit better. But what, what's your mindset of where we're at? in terms of, it seems like we want to get a fair deal for the IRS, for the country, but then resolve as many of these disputes as we can. Some of them claim they're out there a year, six months, eight months. It ties up their energy, their time, and their enterprise. And you mentioned that, you know, the big corporations, one thing, but small business and individuals as well. But I'm just focused right now on small business. Yeah, I, I really appreciate the question, Congressman. Um, I, I haven't mentioned it yet, but one of the things that guides me in the job is the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. I have it in, uh, in framed above my desk. I have it with me today. It's kind of like some people carry around their pocket constitution. I carry around the Taxpayer Bill of Rights because it's so important that in everything we do, we're guided by it. And one of those rights is the right to speedily resolve your issues. And, and I wanna make the right investments so that we are doing that. And that's a multi-pronged set of solutions. It's, for example, having clear notices, clear guidance. So if the law is complicated, the IRS is translating it clearly so there, we, don't, we never get to a dispute. It's doing outreach to small businesses with training and webinars. We're investing to what are your questions and how can we help you? And then it's hiring more people and working to make sure that there is no uh, dispute resolution that's taking too long. I only got a few minutes. I got yeah. to talk a couple of things I want to get through. Identity theft. It was yes. a huge issue. Again, it seems like it's organized groups and stuff are still out there. Where are we at with uh, identity theft, theft now? Because I had a lot of people in our region in Florida where their identity was stolen, the tax returns were filed on behalf of the thief or whatever, or some organized group. Where do you, what's your sense of where yeah. that's at? Well, it's, it's critical uh, and it's, it's a top priority. I mentioned top three things we want to do under the Inflation Reduction Act, and one is prevent people from being victimized. And this is a mixed story. I, I wish it was all good. We've made significant progress in preventing identity theft, working with private sector partners in what we call our security summit. We now prevent 98% of identity theft uh, attacks, if you will. But in the case where there is a victim, as, as, as was re recently pointed out by a taxpayer advocate report, we are not resolving those issues quick enough. And so it's a priority going forward that not only to continue our strong performance in preventing identity theft, but also when it happens and there's a victim, to raise our game and make sure that we're providing that victim assistance uh, in a much more robust way. Yeah. Let me ask you one other thing. On, uh, in terms of customer service, I know you touched on that. Uh, just talking to accountants and things locally, 
Uh, and it does seem like, I want to give you a little credit, it seems like things have got a little bit better, but still, they're on the phone for an over an hour, they're aggravated. Uh, you know, being someone that's in business, you want to take care of those folks as quickly as you can, at least in terms of answering the phone, get their questions answered. Uh, and you touched on it in your early uh, testimony, but where, where's your sense of where that we're going to get to a point where we can answer the phone quicker and try to get them yeah. a little bit more help uh, from a quicker stance? So we're on our main phone line, which is where most of the volume comes, we're at an 85% level of service, um, but there's more to do. There are other phone lines uh, that, uh, that we need to continue to work on and improve. And let me give you an important example of what we're doing. I don't ever want to hear about someone waiting on the phone for an hour. That is heartbreaking, frustrating, but it's also a rallying cry for us. One of the things we've done this year is we've instituted a callback option. And what that means is that the way we're engineering our call center now, if, if your wait time is going to be longer than 15 minutes, we will introduce into the phone, hey, you can, we can schedule a callback option. So you can hang up, no longer listen to elevator music, and we'll call you back. These are the types of improvements. I know this happens in, in your everyday life when you're, when you're on any other call center in the retail industry and otherwise banking industry. We have some catching up to do. But because we have funding, we can make these investments, and these are really helpful to taxpayers because now, if they've got a, a baby crying or something, they can hang up and get a callback option. Thank you, and I yield back. Mr. Doggett is recognized. Thank you very much, and thank you, uh, Commissioner, for the efforts that you and your team have made uh, to address many of the problems that have been created over the last decade prior to the last Congress. Uh, by those who seemed intent on ensuring that IRS would fail by cutting the budget again and again and continually attacking and stirring public dissatisfaction with the IRS. Uh, as I understand your testimony, we've gone from a low of 15 percent satisfaction to 85 percent satisfaction. Is that right? That's correct. I, I remember having not only complaints from constituents before we provided these funds, but even from CPAs and tax preparers that had a special line that were kept holding in the very way you said they are not today. And you could not have had these successes and your team could not have had these successes without the additional funding you were provided by the last Congress. Is that correct? That's correct. Of course, the other area that's very important to me is enforcing our tax laws so that the many people that are out there that are paying their fair share are not abused by those who refuse to do so. And the data that I've seen suggest that audit rates for large corporations in the decade prior to the last Congress were cut in half, and that the audit rates for those who earned over $1 million per year were cut by about 70 percent, that the top 1 percent was getting away with uh, not paying an estimated $160 billion in taxes each year. Uh, I know that you reported progress being made on tax enforcement earlier this year and a significant increase in revenue as a result. Were the people that you were after, were they uh, the kind we hear about in some of these campaign speeches that, you know, just had honest mistakes and, and uh, left a little off their return? Or were they true tax cheats? And can you give us some examples? Yeah, I can't emphasize this enough, Congressman. Our focus, our priority, and our agenda under the Inflation Reduction Act is to increase scrutiny for complex filers, wealthy individuals, large corporations, and complex partnerships that are evading their tax responsibility. It is not our intent to increase scrutiny and invest this money on a new wave of audits for middle and low income. That, that's not going to happen under my watch. And we will be able to publicly report that so that you can hold me accountable for that. With respect to high wealth, there's a lot of different things we're doing to start to catch up and close the gap that's been there for too many years. And one of the things that we can report immediate results on, because often these uh, enforcement actions take time, but there are some things we're doing that should give the American people confidence that we are using this money smartly and in a way that's creating fairness, and that is going after millionaires and billionaires who are delinquent on owed taxes. And this, is, this should frustrate people. These are millionaires and billionaires who have been assessed a tax due and are delinquent in paying it. And we have so many honest Americans who pay their taxes on time. 
and these millionaires and billionaires are not. So we have created this high risk list of 1,600 of these individuals, and we've started to go get the money back. And so far, in the early stages of this effort, we've already collected a half a billion dollars. And that's just scratching the surface. So that should give you a sense of how much inequity there is and how much, if we stay on this path, we're going to be able to close that inequity and, gap. And if I understand, to stay on this path, you've indicated that you need about another $800 million this year. Yes, and th th that is a, 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 an important point about our budget. And, and I'll just, if I could just say it briefly, we are we have a base budget to fund our ongoing operations, keep the lights on, and then we have the Inflation Reduction Act, which is modernizing and helping us build capacities. Our base budget is insufficient to run the daily train schedules. And what that means is we have to borrow from the Modernization Fund just to keep the lights on. And if we keep doing that, we won't modernize. We'll keep the lights on, but we won't build these capacities that are so important to help taxpayers. And I believe the Treasury, just within the last two weeks, has estimated that as much as $561 billion could be collected over the next decade from wealthy and corporate tax cheats that you're focused on. Uh, and yet, unfortunately, our Republican colleagues on this committee and elsewhere seem to have no higher priority, uh, as indicated by the first bill they passed in this Congress, and their efforts at every time we get up to the brink of disaster here that they want to cut the very funding you're relying on to see that these corporate and high wealth tax cheats are treated the same way and pay their taxes the way most Americans do. I just want to thank you for your efforts and we will do all we can to resist the efforts to undermine the progress that you're making. Mr. Smith is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Commissioner, for being here today. I, I want to uh, certainly register the fact that my office uh, continues to receive uh, input from constituents that they are, are not getting their questions answered from the IRS. Uh, I realize you're touting an 85 uh, percent efficiency level uh, in that everything's just amazing at the IRS. I, I, I continue to have concerns that uh, the 80 billion dollars in IRA funding is not uh, uh, giving us uh, the results uh, perhaps that were promised. Also, uh, certainly there's a lack of candor, I believe, from the administration about how the funds are actually being utilized. Particularly troubled that the administration continues to implement policies across numerous agencies, regardless of whether it is legislated authority or, or not. Student loan forgiveness, critical mineral agreements, and the recent changes to the 1099K requirement from ARPA are all examples of this kind of executive overreach. The development of the IRS's direct e-file system also appears to fit that description. While IRA, the, the bill, so-called Inf Inflation Reduction Act, provided $15 million to conduct a study of direct e-file and enumerated the study's parameters, it provided funding for only nine months and said nothing uh, about actually implementing that system. The nine months authorized for that study have now lapsed, as I'm sure you're aware. Can you tell me explicitly what authority the IRS relied on to create an entirely new government-run system of filing taxes since the law only provided authority to conduct a study on direct e -file, on the direct e-file system. And I'm not looking for other examples of the IRS helping people file their taxes. I, I get that. I want specific language from the federal code authorizing the particular pilot. Yeah, absolutely, Congressman. I appreciate the question. So we do have a, a responsibility and an authority to, uh, to offer taxpayers different approaches for how to meet their tax obligation. I can give you the exact uh, uh, statutory site for that. Um, what's critical about the direct file solution is that it is an option. There is no mandate for anyone to use this solution should they choose right, but, it. But you're, you're saying there's direct authority to do so? There's direct authority to uh, implement the tax system in a way that provides uh, tools and solutions for taxpayers to meet their tax responsibility. Generically speaking, but... but yeah, well, know, paper, electronic, calling us on the telephone. Not, not everything is, is delineated precisely in law. So for example, if we create a Adobe version of the tax form that you can fill in online, we've done that. There's not a specific legal authority to do that, but there is a legal uh, description of the commissioner's responsibilities. And one of those responsibilities is to provide taxpayers with 
avenues for how they can meet their tax obligation. And this is just one avenue. It's not a mandate. It's an option. Well, I, I understand that, which may not be a mandate, it does not always mean there's the authority to do so. And I would argue that that is the case right now. I, I'm, I'm specifically uh, troubled, troubled by uh, the claim that there's that authority there when I don't believe that there is. Uh, but uh, let's go back to the topic um, I've discussed with you and Secretary Yellen previously on multiple occasions, and that's audits targeting families earning less than $400,000. I continue to have concerns that despite the claims from Secretary Yellen and others uh, that the administration cannot and will not fulfill its promise about audit targets and also meet its claims about increased revenue. Last year you said in response to a question for the record that the IRS is committed to ensuring that none of the funds provided by the IRA will be used to increase audit rates for small businesses and households making less than $400,000 annually relative to historical levels, and that's, that's a quote. The phrase historical levels means something higher than the current audit rates. Is that accurate? No, it's not accurate. Uh, we're, we've, we've been public, I don't think. Let me, let me, let me tell you what the, the current situation is. Um, tax year 2018 will be the base year that we will utilize to make sure that the audit okay. rate for those that earn less than 400,000 okay. is not exceeded. Reclaiming that. my time because time Sorry. is of the essence here. I, uh, I, I'd like to learn more about that, but I would also like to know if the IRS can provide us with a distributional table uh, for the $561 billion and the $851 billion estimates of revenue uh, generation and uh, do, you, do you know when we could plan to see that? Well, we have a public report on that, so I would be happy to uh, engage with your staff to understand what are the specific questions or additional layers of information beyond the public report. How did you decide to choose uh, 2018 as, as the year uh, to establish the, the historical rate, uh, levels of audits? Well, in large measure because it is a historically low rate and we wanted to assure uh, the taxpaying community that the Inflation Reduction Act would not be used to increase the audit rate uh, among uh, middle and low income. And so we chose 2018 as a historic low rate to provide additional assurances and we wanted to be specific so that we can be transparent and hold me to account and the IRS to account because each year we publish our audit rate in our data book. So you can go into our data book right now and see exactly what the audit rate is for 2018. And then when we finish with tax year 23 and the audit rates are complete, you'll say, oh, let me see. Did they meet their mandate? And it should be all public. Okay. Uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, you're, you've generated about $500 million, half a billion, I think, in your, in your words, of, of revenue from about 1,600 targeted taxpayers. Uh, that would be on average of just over $300,000 per taxpayer. Uh, how, how many resources, uh, the dollar figure of the IRS taxpayer dollars, do you think it would take on average to, to reach that level? Uh, I'd have to get back to you on a specific, but it certainly has a very positive ROI in general. Uh, and this is uh, something that the Congressional Budget Office has, uh, has uh, publicly reported, that in general, we uh, return $6 for every $1 invested. So on average, you should expect about a one to six ratio. So we spend a sixth of those resources to get the job done, in on average. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Commissioner. Thank you for being here. First, congratulations for the work the IRS has done over the past several months. As the ranking uh, member, uh, Chairman Neal, mentioned, Democrats on this committee made an historic investment in the IRS last year when we passed the Inflation Reduction Act. Since then, I can tell you, I've heard from my staff in all three of my district offices how well uh, they're working with the IRS. Uh, they, they have contact with your office hundreds if not thousands of times a year, and they tell me that uh, the uh, IRS is noticeably significantly smoother uh, than they've ever been before. Uh, you're responding faster, your responses are better, people answer the phones, my staff find the taxpayer advocates to be reliable and helpful partners as we try and uh, work with our constituents. 
Uh, I've personally worked with you and with your team uh, on uh, specific issues, and I want to thank you. I've always found it, uh, you to be helpful and your team to be professional uh, and very well uh, prepared. Uh, unfortunately, the majority seems to think that the IRS budget is a slush fund to pay for every uh, program that they want to uh, pass and, and, and put into law. And uh, I've lost track how many times they've tried to use the IRS budget to offset spending, despite reams of evidence uh, proving that IRS cuts actually increase the deficit. I believe the only reason uh, to work to cut the IRS budget is, if, is to uh, either make consumer services worse or to make cheating on your taxes easier. I understand people don't like paying taxes, but this is how we fund uh, our civilized uh, uh, society and the many programs that our constituents uh, care about. So while um, we can disagree about tax policy uh, on, on the specifics, we ought to all agree that on a bipartisan basis that people should follow the law and pay the taxes uh, that they owe. Uh, Commissioner, when IRS funding is cut, what happens to our deficit? It goes up. Um, in fact, um, for every $100 million taken uh, from the IRS, the deficit grows by $600 million over 10 years. Um, and, and that's because... $600 million. $600 Increase million. in our deficit. For every $100 million cut, it's right. a $600 million increase right. in our deficit. So when, they, when the IRS funding is cut, uh, is it harder or is it easier for people to cheat on their taxes? It's, it's easier. And um, let me just, if I can go through $100 million, what that, what that buys you at the IRS, 700 audits of, uh, of high-income taxpayers, millionaires and billionaires, 200 audits of, uh, of complex partnerships, 100 audits of uh, large corporations, 32,000 collection cases, of wealthy individuals, and on and on. And that's just from the 100 million, so it, clearly it has an impact. Thank you. Uh, one thing that hopefully we can agree on on both sides of the dais is uh, modernization. Can you talk a little bit more about how you've used uh, I, I, uh, Inflation Reduction Act investments to modernize? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's, uh, you know, one of the things that inspires me, uh, Congressman, is uh, before the Inflation Reduction Act, there was a a famous picture in the Washington Post of our of our cafeteria in Austin, Texas, filled with unreviewed uh, returns in paper. Um, that cafeteria is now clean. Uh, people are eating in it rather than us storing uh, tax returns. That's because we are aggressively digitizing and scanning all of our paper as part of our initiative to go paperless. This is important, not because it's more efficient and more secure, but it means that we're gonna process more quickly. And one of the things that's going on due to our modernization is we have significantly reduced the ongoing uh, backlog of, of returns and correspondences. Thank you. Uh, I'd, I'd like to just uh, take a moment to talk about the investment in uh, climate uh, uh, change uh, in the IRA. Uh, this was a the biggest in investment in climate uh, 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 work his, in history uh, in our country. Uh, how would you describe the rollout so far, and uh, how would you characterize the uptake on tax credits like EV or solar credits? Yeah, we've had a successful launch. Uh, in January, uh, we launched our, our portal, our IT solution, that allows those that are eligible for credits related to uh, the manufacturing and the transactions associated with electronic vehicles. And uh, like any new solution, there are certain uh, things that we could do to make it better and improve the customer experience. But overall, it's been uh, robust participation and the system has performed as expected. Thank you, I yield back. Mr. Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for conducting the hearing today. Mr. Warfels, good to see you again. Good to see you. Uh, I think some of the questions revolve around this. We do telephone town halls and we did one uh, a little bit over a week ago. And it, it, when we do IRS town halls, 
uh, it just seems like we can't be on the phone long enough, and the IRS provides people, and the, the taxpayer advocate is there on the phone with us. But I don't think there's anything more complicated than what we're talking about today when it comes to the IRS and the rules and how it works and, and who's paying fairly and who's taking advantage, and it goes back and forth. I wish we could just get to a situation of, is this a program, is this an agency that runs in the best interest of the people who fund it? and the same people who fund everything else in our government, and that is hardworking American taxpayers. I've, I've got to tell you, that from a, a standpoint of formerly being in the private sector, and, and have, uh, while I was present, I was not in the operation at the time of going through the early days of the pandemic. And one of the things that came out, which was a, a, a really good idea, was the em Employee ret uh, Retention Tax Credit Program. However, however, uh, we're, we continue to look at programs and we tend to look at, at holdups in it. Uh, my son runs our business and I talked to him on the phone about it quite a bit. He said, I think the biggest thing would have been had employers been able to get some help or some counsel on how that was working or how it was supposed to work, how, how they could do that. But we look back on it now and we're trying to find out what is going on with, with that program. And, and while there's, there's all kind of different figures floating around about what it has cost, uh, I, I would just caution people to say, you know, anytime we say it costs the government, uh, we keep in mind that it actually then gave taxpayers a break on, on what comes out of their wallet, knowing that they, pro they provide every single penny, either, either with their wages or by co-signing a loan to fund this incredible operation. Uh, so when it comes to the IRS right now and, 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 and ensuring that small businesses receive their ERTCs, uh, how... How, what's the oversight in that, and how can you help us with that? Because I, I have a number of friends, and, and I met with our former representative Billy Long the other day, whose concern for a lot of the people that he still works with is the fact that there is confusion on, confusion on what quarter is being funded and what is the timeline and what's ending and what's still in operation and where should we go from here. It's, um, well, first of all, I appreciate the question and, and the way you worded it because how you can help. One of the things I've learned early in my tenure here at the IRS is that we can't do this alone. Uh, implementing the tax system is a partnership. It's a partnership with IRS and tax professionals, taxpayers, Congress. The ERC is, is an incredibly complicated program. It's, it was critical and played a critical role. We issued 3.6 million ERCs to date, and it was an economic lifeline for people that, that needed it. Um, what happened is, is the further we got away from the period of eligibility, because the, the demonstrated uh, loss that you have in order to claim eligibility uh, ended on December 31st, 2021. The further we got away from it, the more uh, aggressive promoters and marketers started, in my opinion, taking advantage of honest small businesses and getting them to believe that they were eligible for a credit they truly weren't eligible for. So 18 months, 19 months, 20 months after that period of eligibility, the number of ERC credits coming in to the IRS was actually increasing, 50,000 a week, 60,000 a week, 70,000 a week. And we started to realize that there were so many ineligible claims in what was coming in. It was getting harder and harder to separate what's ineligible from eligible. And that's why we issued the moratorium in September of 2023 because we wanted to slow the flow of these uh, credits uh, coming in and make sure that we were not paying out fraudulent claims. And so what we announced is we're gonna have to slow the process down to protect taxpayers, not just taxpayers, the financial bottom line, taxpayers don't want us spending out fraudulent claims, but also protect small businesses who may have been taken advantage by these aggressive promoters. Well, I appreciate that. But the guidance is the key to all these things as we go through it, and these are very complicated issues, but there are people who, who fouled uh, believing that this was going to be taken care of, and it, it is, it, you're, you're on hold, you're on hold, you're on hold, and you don't know. It makes it very difficult for people then to actually file their claims at the end of every year. Just one thing covered real quickly. Um, the direct file program. So we've had people in the private sector running this, and, and, and I think we've had great success with it. Uh, why? Why did the IRS get, invo get involved in this? Yeah. And what is it that, that we're trying to achieve? And they, I, listen, you're down to one second. I don't expect an answer that quickly. But if you get back to me in that, because Absolutely. I think that is an legitimate question of a, if we have all these available already through the private sector, and we're talking about being money being well spent, 
Well, I think it's already there for people. I don't understand what role the IRS would have in that, and, and I, 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 don't question, I don't question the, the fact that you think you could help. Uh, it's already there. Thank you. I, I yield back, sir. Thank you, Mr. Pascrell. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. It's a lovely day in the neighborhood. Commissioner Werfel, Werfel, you've been a breath of fresh air to me. We had a little problems with the last guy who sat in your seat. Welcome back. After years of chaos, very new day at the IRS. Last month, you already talked about it. The IRS announced it had recovered $485 million from only uh, 1,600 millionaires. The question of fairness in the tax system is at hand. We all have different opinions about it, but I believe, or else I wouldn't say it, I believe that you're there to oversee fairness. The guy next door to me where I live, in my house in New Jersey, if he doesn't pay his property taxes, and the guy on the next block from us doesn't pay his property taxes, people understand now that we're going to have to pay higher property taxes unless some other kind of revenue was found. It's tax fairness. Hey, what you're supposed to pay, and people will complain less. People believe many times, Mr. Werfel, Commissioner, that they're being shafted when it comes to figuring out tax policy. And I think you and I have an obligation to address that day in and day out. The tip of the iceberg. Last week, we learned that we will recover at least $560 billion from rich tax cheats after the next decade. So you've been portrayed, the group, the agency you work for has been betrayed as, oh, they're coming after you. See, create fear that you're the bad guys. Lincoln dealt with that during the Civil War. Very honestly, if money was going to be used for the war, how would the towns throughout the America, you know, build their roads, their hospitals, their schools, et cetera, et cetera? That's why we have a big argument over salt. I hear from my own neighbors, you are now answering our calls. Refund checks are going out faster. These successes are because of, I think, your leadership and because of a stark funding passed by Democrats, mostly, to make the IRS work for regular Americans. Wow. I remind everyone, every single Republican in Congress voted against the Inflation Reduction Act and against funding for the IRS to do its job. I mean, the facts are the facts. As Tom Swasey would say, the facts are the facts. Members of the other side have made IRS funding their white well to be harpooned at any cost. They have clawed back one quarter of the historic funding. Like the shark in Jaws, they want another bite. The Congressional Budget Office has estimated that that funding that I believe Republicans stole away will cost the American people double, nearly $400 billion, nearly $40 billion, excuse me. So I have a question for you. Millionaires and billionaires need to pay their fair share. I think everybody will agree up here. I think. I'm not sure. What is the IRS doing to audit high net wealth individuals 
and tax cheats. Congressman, it's where we're focused. And we're taking multiple different steps. First of all, we're hiring additional accountants, auditors, and where they're being deployed and where we're shifting our audit workforce is to make sure that we're focusing efforts on high wealth individuals because that's where we think we have a growing problem of tax evasion uh, and we need to address it. We're deploying technology differently. We're using analytics and AI to better understand how money moves in these very complicated arrangements. You know, whole, whole, you know, companies with subsidiaries and subsidiaries to those subsidiaries, money moving across international jurisdictions, uh, understating their profits in the U.S., doing all of these things that are difficult to track, and we're investing in subject matter expertise, people, technology, analytics, all so that we can catch up and make this fair, because we should be able to have equal ability to assess the guy down the street's taxes as your taxes. And if you're middle and low income, mostly your taxes are fairly simple. And we have the means and the capacity to assess it. Where we have lost the capacity is for the complicated situations. And when we're underfunded, that gap grows. And so as long as I'm commissioner and the funding is available, where I'm gonna focus is on the gap where the tax returns are complicated and where the evasion is expanding. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Schweikert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Commissioner, and forgive me because I'm assembling some of the numbers right in front of me, um, because it, it, as the chairman spoke, I have a fixation that the adoption of technology is the ultimate solution here. It's the solution for the left that wants more tax receipts and for those of us who want a friendlier, more efficient, um, and, and, and you know, uh, effective IRS. Um, you before made a comment that, hey, it's six to one, but I'm looking at, even, and this is even from the re preliminary data from um, Representative Pasquale actually asked for a CBO report, and your press release that you took in 520 million, but I'm looking at your cost, I actually see you, for every dollar, it costs you $10.96. Now, I accept there's capital expenditures in there, and over time, they'll be amortized out, but most of the IRA funding looks like it's gone towards operations and consultants. In, in, in the conversations you and I have had, my fixation is the only way you get that, because that's completely opposite than our discussion before. Right now, costs are actually fairly high for those additional dollars. The adoption and the purchase of technology, the use of commercial databases to ping off to know something, should dramatically lower your cost of collections and make your collections much more efficient, fair, um, open. Tell me the story. Ten, am, am I off base? Is it we have to hire armies of people? Or is technology my nirvana? Well, first of all, I can assure you that investment in exam and audit has a positive return on well, investment. Well, Mr. Commissioner, I'm, I'm looking at the CBO's numbers should, and your own press release we should, numbers. We should, and, uh, and they, I, I'm getting a, a basic division I'm pretty good at. I'm so, happy so, to, to so walk through the map with you. I'd be but happy to get your report. To, to answer your question on the technology, it's, it's, it's essential. Um, the, the, the whole effort underway is really about modernization. Um, and that, and it's, it's at every level. Technology is gonna help us uh, process quicker and more efficiently, more accurately, and more securely. Technology is gonna help taxpayers have an easier time with, uh, it's gonna take them less time to do their taxes, it's, and hopefully be less expensive. In, in my, so what can I do as the person here on this panel who's absolutely fixated? What do I do to help you get there? Well, first of all, we'd appreciate your peer review of our technology plans. And I know my team has already briefed your team, but yes. we should regularly. And, and, and I have to, and I can't believe I'm saying your team has actually been great in communicating with me. That doesn't surprise me. So. But, but my point is, is that we have a lot of different um, opportunities to advance technology at every level, our website, the tools that taxpayers have. The chat, the, the chat for calling. The chat function, and, yeah. And, and I wish at some point, I would love you to talk about your experiment last cycle and the expansion of that this tax season. Yeah, we're adding chat functionality, uh, whether it's 
uh, automated chat, so you're talking to a, a computer, and then it advances if the computer can't answer as it goes to live chat. These are just, th these are standard activities in the private sector and in many other public sector call centers. We're just catching up. And we're catching up because we now have the funding to modernize versus just keep the lights on. Is there, but, it, it, and if I'm wrong, don't tell me. I, everyone else tells me I'm wrong. Um, but that adoption of technology should dramatically change your structural cost of collections. Correct. And, and that's my hope because, you know, on our side we fret over the 80 billion and was that going to be hiring people or was it going to be hiring efficiencies? And, you know, for my Democrat colleagues, it's going after wealthy people. But, um, and, and I do look forward to your staff providing me because you've taken in, in your own press release, 520 um, million and I see a cost uh, from actually that press release and the Pasquale um, preliminary CBO audit of 5.7. The uh, last thing I'm going to ask you, just because we get a lot of inbound on this, on the employer retention. Yes. I, I accept that's been just what it is. Please, guidance as fast as you can. So whether it be the small business, whether it even be the promoters, everyone sort of knows what the rules are knows what the timing is, and knows how to close this out. Um, and, and, and I know you have to run things by armies of lawyers and those things. Buy them caffeine, get it done. Let me just, if I could, we have a special section on irs.gov just on our ERC, what to look out for, do's and don'ts, why you might not be in ineligible. We did a webinar on, on February 8th that had 8,000 registered participants and we're running um, educational series all over the country. We're doing, as, uh, we're doing a lot, we obviously be doing more, and so we're willing to obviously listen to ideas about how we get out there and talk to people about this program and make the entire process yeah. clear. I, I think the question is also the, the processing time, uh, what's yes. eligible, not eligible, and just when does it sort of get there. And with that, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, Commissioner, let me welcome and thank you and the Internal Revenue Services for its outstanding success in ensuring a fairer tax system in which the wealthy and well-connected pay their fair share. I want to make you aware of the outstanding work of the Chicago Taxpayer Advocate Service. I am grateful for B.C. Oliver Ramiel. Katrina Britt, Arlene Merritt, Fred Tavares, and the rest of the Chicago team who have used their expertise to help my constituents. I also thank Robert Chapman with the DC Legislative Affairs team for his assistance. As you may know, I helped champion many of the key 2021 EITC and CDCTC enhancements, like lowering the EITC age to 19 for all workers, or 18 for foster or homeless youth, and giving working parents up to $8,000 for childcare expenses. I'd like to work with you to better understand the patterns in the use of those credits to inform efforts to restore them. For example, how many younger workers got the EITC in 2021 who are excluded under current law? Or how many foster homeless youth use their provisions? Or how many more working parents benefited from the refundable CDCTC? who would not under current law. Do you have any updates you can share with us about who benefited and how from the 2021 Earned Income Tax Credit and CDCTC enhancements compared to other years? I'm proud that I helped lead the effort to make the VITA program permanent. 
I know that the Internal Revenue Services IRA Strategic Operating Plan Initiative 1.9 includes the goal of expanding the coverage and scope of the VITA and TCE free tax preparation programs. Have any specific strategies been identified for accomplishing that goal? And how has the IRS involved VITA and TCE organizations in developing those strategies? Thank you for those questions, Congressman. On your data question, uh, we have uh, now awareness of that question, and our research and analytics team is working to get you answer as, as quickly as possible. I will say, and I'll connect your first question to your second question, we know that there are people eligible for earned income tax credit that are not claiming eligibility. They're not claiming eligibility because they may not know about it. They might not be claiming eligibility because they're intimidated by the complexity of the eligibility formula. Uh, they just need help. And so we can do more outreach and working with community partners to make sure that people are aware of this benefit and are getting the help they need. The, you mentioned our, our, uh, our volunteers uh, for both underserved populations and the elderly. Uh, I would love to grow those programs, working with local communities on what we call taxpayer experience days, having more and more of those around the country with an educational campaign around what you may be eligible for, and then with free help available to sit with you and walk you through. I've been to uh, one of these uh, volunteer sites in Baltimore, and uh, it's, it's an amazing um, uh, experience to witness uh, these volunteers there with taxpayers who would have not otherwise gotten the help they needed, and they're just very appreciative, and the volunteers are passionate about helping people get the benefits they're eligible for. Thank you very much, and I look forward to working with you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. LaHood. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you, Commissioner Werfel, for being here today and for your service. Um, I'm the uh, chair of our subcommittee on work and welfare that oversees a number of different federal programs. One of those is child support. And I want to focus my, focus my questions on child support enforcement. And um, as you know, uh, CSE program um, works with the IRS on collecting child support um, for non-custodial parents uh, to help children and families to get the money that they deserve through your program, which is the Federal Tax Refund Offset Program. Uh, this is a vital source of income for millions of families across the country. Uh, in my home state of Illinois, 44,000 families and children depend on and receive $65 million through the Federal Tax Refund Offset Program. Uh, to service these families uh, participating in this program, many states, uh, 42 states uh, in particular, um, uh, rely on the federal tax information through third-party contractors. And that's the way it's been done since 2004. A year ago, without consultation to Congress uh, and without us an opportunity to work with you on that, the IRS um, made the decision abruptly to change this policy and this has caused a shift. Now all states and C, um, CSE programs that use contractors will be in noncompliance as of October. So we did a bipartisan hearing in November, and across the board, people were frustrated. They were extremely, um, uh, you know, uh, there, there was lots of questions on why the IRS did this and why they're putting states in jeopardy on this. I'll give you an example. The Illinois Administrator of Child Support Services, Brian Tribble, he testified right where you were at, about, to our subcommittee that this policy change by the IRS will cost Illinois hundreds of millions of dollars to implement new systems and hire employees. And furthermore, if states are unable to come into compliance in time by this October, their entire CSE program could be in jeopardy of losing federal matching funds, resulting in millions of families and children losing their child support payments. So what I'm trying to figure out, Commissioner, and I'd love your explanation on it, why this was done without consultation to Congress to put an equitable solution in place and possibly legislation to remedy this, and why was this sudden change done? Um, if you can, and, and by the way, the stress and anxiety this is putting these 40 state, 42 states through is immense. 
Yeah, I appreciate the question. And this was an issue that was brought to my attention very early in my tenure back in, uh, in March of 23. And I, like you, had a lot of questions about uh, the, the, the policy itself uh, and why we had issued it. Um, and I immediately uh, engaged with the Department of Health and Human Services, who runs the child support program, to understand what the IRS could do to reset the expectation across, uh, ta across states, contractors, and others. Um, at this moment, that policy uh, announcement is paused. We are, we are not uh, moving forward, and now we have the opportunity to do the very engagement that, that you uh, are suggesting. So we have uh, told HHS that, uh, that we are going to take more time to make sure that, the, uh, that, that we've heard from stakeholders appropriately before we um, finalize any such policy. So just to clarify, the pause that you just referenced, does that affect the October 24 deadline? I believe it does, but I want to get back to you with more specifics. Well, that, that's obviously very important. Very important, are Coming yes. into compliance. I mean, do you have an estimate of how much this will cost states to come into compliance with this new policy? I don't have it at my fingertips, but this is why it's so important to get this right. I mean, and, and just another issue that is part of the collateral damage is there are 60 federally recognized Native American tribes that also fall into this category, too. And, and, and they're in a, a much more tougher position because of some of the financial and economic issues there because of this IRS policy. And so um, they're in jeopardy of losing access to critical child support enforcement tool, those tribes. So I, I want to mention that to you, and this needs to take needs to be a priority for you and your department. Yeah, I want to make this commitment to the extent, and I need to go back to the office and, and make sure that I have the details. We did pause to the extent it is intending to go back in October of 24, as you mentioned. I want to talk to you about the implications of that, and I'm happy to revisit that with you to make sure we're getting all the right data and feedback before we move forward. I look forward to it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Werfel, for um, testifying today. I want to join my colleagues in recognizing the hard work that the IRS employees, the Taxpayer Advocate Service, and other federal workers put in every day to help American workers, seniors, and families file their tax returns and claim the federal benefits that they've all earned. I also appreciate that many members of Congress share Democratic tax writers' commitment to specifically to improving the child tax credit. Most of us recognize that the CTC is one of the most powerful tools for fighting poverty in this country, but we can all agree that the devil is in the details where that is concerned. Unfortunately, my colleagues on the other side of the dais disagree with congressional Democrats on how generous relief for working families should be. Um, but as a mom and a legislator, I'm going to continue to fight to ensure that our nation's tax code benefits all households with children, and that means even parents or caregivers who don't even earn enough to owe and pay federal income taxes. I believe that they also deserve some financial relief. I was disappointed when my Republican tax writing colleagues killed the good faith amendment that Mr. Davis and I offered on the Wyden-Smith tax bill uh, just a few weeks ago. Our, our, our amendment would have strengthened the bill by restoring full refundability for the child tax credit. We've all seen data showing that millions of children across the US could benefit from even a modest expansion of the child tax credit. And I am specifically looking out for those families who earn so little that they can't claim this tax relief at all, even though they are raising children. Commissioner, I wanna thank you again for answering our questions today. And I wanna talk a little bit about um, something that was raised earlier about the deadbeat millionaires and billionaires who are cheating on their taxes and evading their, their responsibility to pay their fair share. Um, I would say that I don't think anybody loves paying their taxes, but I think people do it if they feel like the system is fair and everybody pays their fair share. Um, what would happen if middle-income and low-income Americans uh, didn't pay their taxes or cheated on their taxes at the same rate that these millionaires and billionaires did. What would happen? Well, I mean, the deficit would grow. 
Um, I mean, the, the IRS, uh, and it, you're right, tax pay, uh, paying your taxes isn't, the, isn't your favorite activity of, of the year, uh, for sure. But uh, we fund virtually the entire government through those tax collections. And in, and in order to have a functioning government, whether you want that government big or small, uh, the IRS needs to function effectively and there needs to be equity uh, in our tax system. Otherwise, people will lose trust and trust is what our tax system is built on. Now, when you say the revenues you get fund, fund government, that means our defense, our national defense, correct? It, it, is, it is everything that the government does, keeping our skies safe, so your air traffic controllers, your food safe. When you go to the restaurant and you have confidence that your children are eating food that's not gonna make them sick, that's all government funding and that's all made possible if we have a functioning tax system. Now, if the IRS could collect what these deadbeat millionaires and billionaires and huge corporations actually owe, might we be able to pay for the child tax credit to be expanded or perhaps even fully refundable? There's absolutely money being left on the table in terms of what is owed versus what is paid. And this is particularly an area of focus for high wealth taxpayers and complicated situations. And as I mentioned, when I arrived at the IRS, my question was, what are the gaps we need to close? Where are the gaps most problematic? And one of them was during our period of underfunding, we had lost pace with keeping up with these complex returns and the risk of evasion had grown. So if we could get these complex uh, tax filers to pay their fair share, which I'm assuming are a lot of these big corporations that have different subsidiaries and different companies and they move the money around and these millionaires and billionaires that have sophisticated accountants and tax attorneys that can help them evade taxes. If we could collect what they owe, we could potentially expand or even make the child tax credit fully refundable so that kids and babies who go to bed hungry every night in this country um, would be lifted out of that hunger and lifted out of that poverty? I leave it to the wisdom of Congress to decide how to use the money. I just want to make sure that uh, tax returns are complete, accurate, and what is owed is what is paid. I appreciate your testimony today, and I thank you for your answers, and I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Hearn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing today. Mr. Werfel, last November, two Democrat senators in press releases bragged about the pressure they put on you and the IRS to delay implementation of the new 1099K threshold that passed in the Partisan American Rescue Plan. Both of these senators previously voted in favor of the change. The Democrat senators also bragged about the IRS decision to change the threshold to $5,000, which it would seem to not have the authority to do so. With all due respect, Mr. Werfel, and I know you're in a tough job, but this looks like you're blatantly not enforcing the law and are also unilaterally changing the law because Senate Democrats in the current administration are having second thoughts about just how terrible this policy is that's been enacted. It is my job to provide oversight on this, and the American people do not trust this administration. Why would they, when this administration does not enforce a law that passed through a Democrat-controlled Congress and was signed by a Democrat president? Now that we are in an election year, President Biden's administration refuses, refuses to implement the law and unilaterally change the law in a favor because the law in the books is politically unfavorable and punitive to the average American. My colleagues are touch, will touch on this, have touched on this for you, but I, I want to ask you a question regarding the direct e-file program that's just been recently implemented. Isn't it true that private sectors provide free return preparation services outside of the government free file program? Yes. Do you, how many, what's that estimate of how many they've done based on your uh, data? I don't know the exact number, uh, but uh, the free file program has been one of the central staples of how we provide free help to taxpayers. So, but it's, it's, when you say it's free, we're actually having to fund that from your side, right? I mean, you don't, you're not, you don't have this just technology driven, it's not AI driven, 
is driven with people in your office, offices that are, that are actually administering this, that are... You're talking about the free file program or the direct file program? So the free the file... Free, free file. So yeah. The, yeah. Free, well, we work with the Free File Alliance. These are commercial software providers that have signed on to help uh, provide a path for eligible taxpayers to use their product for free to file their taxes. That is something, and you know, there's, there's resources that the IRS does to ensure that partnership is as successful as possible. So on the direct e-file program that you're doing, you're yes. competing directly with those corporations. I don't see it as a competition. I see it as another option for taxpayers. So if you're saying that these services are provided by corporations, free, and others that are doing business, so we have it there. And so when you say it's, it's free to the American people, you're saying you're providing these services internally, doesn't cost you anything, there's no taxpayer dollars used in your organization for administrative costs to do this? No, there is a cost and we've been public about what the potential and uh, cost would be. The, the goal is to provide taxpayers with options and to help the taxpayers pick the solution for filing taxes that's best for them. Some will file in paper, we encourage them to file electronically. Some will hire an accountant. Some will go to the commercial software and pay. Some will go to the commercial software and try to work that into, for free. And what we heard from taxpayers, and we heard it pretty loudly, was that there was an interest in having an option where they could file directly with the IRS for free. And we wanted to uh, test but, but whether that option was viable. Ruffles, with all due respect, it, isn't that the sort of the old uh, phrase that Ronald Reagan used, we're from the government, we're just here to help? I mean, it's not free. I mean, listen, we've given you billions of dollars. This is not free for you to provide this service to American people. When I know it might be shocking, but from the data we've gotten from these commercial companies that you've described, somewhere 29 million tax returns have been filed through the direct, uh, for the free file program that they have out there. And so I just, uh, or the direct e-file program rather, just want to make sure that, you know, again, everybody thinks if the government does it, it's free. It's not free if the government provides these services. It is costing taxpayer dollars to provide that. Yeah, so here's, here's how I would answer that. Uh, I would change the, the President Reagan uh, uh, statement a little bit. We're from the government, and here's an option. And if you don't want to use the option, you don't need to. And we're just piloting it this year, a small-scale pilot. So what's going to happen is we'll evaluate what was the cost, what was the experience, is there a demand for taxpayers? Do taxpayers want the IRS to provide this option? Yeah, Mr. Orford, all, all due respect, uh, you know, I've only been up here five and a half years, and this is a, the age-old thought, and this is long before you got into government and I got into government. Everybody wants to talk about the federal government having money that it really doesn't. It has taxpayer dollars that funds our government. I think we would agree with that. So we're using, I think it ought to be described, it's not free, it's funded by other taxpayers, and, and them as well, if they're using the service, if they qualify, my guess is, is, I don't know what the criteria is, but my guess is, is to qualify for that program is that they're probably not paying taxes and it's, it's a refundable credit that they're getting in many cases. Um, but I'm just saying it's not free. It's, and we should say it's paid for by taxpayer dollars. And you know, this, this misnomer that we get government services for free is just not true. It's disingenuous. I yield back. Ms. Sewell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Commissioner, for being here today so that we can talk about the very important relationship between taxpayers and the IRS. Uh, tax seasons can be very uh, stressful for millions of American families and small businesses, and I'm happy that we're taking important steps today to highlight tax filing experiences that have resulted in a more sensible, fair, and more efficient process. The road to this point has been a long one. The IRS has had their work cut out from them for them uh, with a very long list of major implementation issues over the last decade. But today I'm glad to hear that the IRS, through the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, is improving its interactions with the public. Last year, in this very same setting, you and I were able to discuss the well-documented reports over the last few filing seasons that recipients of the Earned Income Tax Credit face significantly higher audit rates than other taxpayers. These findings were discussed uh, in detail, and I appreciate our colloquy. Um, EITC audits are more heavily concentrated in the southeast of the United States and including many of the counties that I represent in Alabama's uh, rural and underserved Black Belt. 
In fact, Greene County, Alabama, in my district, was among the 10 most audited counties in the country for EITC recipients. And I venture to guess that the median income for a family of four in Greene County is less than $30,000 a year. Since our conversation last year, you penned a letter to Congress in September of 2023 mentioning the administration of additional steps and an initial round of changes that have been uh, made regarding the audit process for EITC. I do believe accountability uh, is a direct result of transparency, and with that, the opportunity to ask you um, whether or not uh, this initial round of changes can you, that you highlighted in the letter to Congress has resulted in less audits on underserved communities. Uh, it will. I want to start by saying it is, uh, you know, there are certain solemn responsibilities that the IRS has uh, that we have to meet our mission. Uh, we have to meet our mission in a way that uh, avoids uh, disparate impact. Uh, and in this case, uh, there was uh, evidence that our audits in earned income tax credit was having a disparate impact on black taxpayers. And we have to first acknowledge it, mm -hmm. uh, and, and now we have to fix it. And one of the significant things that that uh, independent study uh, reported was driving the disparity was the volume of the ITC audits. So one of the key things we've announced is a significant and dramatic reduction in the number of EITC audits plan for this coming tax year as a way to address it. We also are testing changes in the audit selection algorithm that we have a hypothesis will remediate the disparate impact that has been occurring. And we'll, it'll take a little bit of time to validate that. We hope to update that, uh, you know, um, maybe in the fall uh, um, where we have more data to make sure that we're reporting publicly that the steps we took had the impact that we, we wanted it to have. Well, I will uh, definitely be awaiting such a report. I think it's really important uh, that we don't target uh, certain populations, especially those that are underserved uh, populations. And, and for something as important, uh, but not often claimed, like the Earn Income Tax Credit. So I look forward to working with you in any way I can to help address this issue. Um, as you rightfully said, it is a, um, a it is disproportionately affecting African American taxpayers, and it really is unacceptable in this day and age. So I thank you for your candor, and I look forward to working with you to see if we can reduce those numbers. Thank you, Congresswoman. Mr. Smucker. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, uh, Mr. Werfel, Commissioner. Uh, I'm uh, actually okay with audits. We want people to uh, pay their taxes, and there should be a random way of selecting some t uh, tax returns to ensure that uh, there's an incentive for people to comply. I do want to, um, however, um, get your thinking uh, about some st statements that you made this morning. You've multiple times uh, talked about uh, high income earners, you've talked about millionaires and billionaires, you've talked about complex tax returns in the same uh, sentence as tax avoidance and tax evasion. Do you believe that millionaires and billionaires are all tax cheats? I do not. Uh, do you believe that there is a reason for complex returns rather, uh, other than to avoid um, uh, t uh, taxes? A absolutely, there is. What would be some of those reasons? Well, I, I, here's my understanding, that, uh, that, that uh, CFOs of major companies, they have a responsibility to their board and to their shareholders to find the most tax advantage status. The concern, and they so, should. So it would be a problem for you if they took a legitimate tax Never. deduction? Never, no, if their, if their return is accurate and complete and legitimate, great. But that's not the concern that we have. That's not the, the, the issue. The issue was that because the IRS was not auditing it, at, 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 our audit rates were anemic because we weren't investing in keeping pace, that these efforts in certain cases got to aggressive avoidance and then even evasion. And I can give you examples of where it's more prolific, and that's really where we want to focus. Well, it's where well, well, these efforts I, it's have just, become, It's just troubling to me when you keep using the ter those terms in the same sentence as if all high income earners, who by the way are paying most of our taxes, 
uh, are all looking to avoid taxes because that's not my experience with business owners, with, with corporate leaders. Uh, they want to do what's right. And so, you know, it concerns me going into an audit. Uh, you know, everyone is innocent until proven guilty. And if your entire organization is taking the approach that you're taking today, uh, you're actually feeling that people are guilty before the audit is even done. It was not my intention. My intention is to make sure we're increasing scrutiny on complex returns where there's high risk of evasion. Uh, do you have any information on um, what percentage of returns on high income earners uh, result in no change? I can get that information for you. I don't have that at my fingertips. Do you have any information regarding the change rate after audits in all income uh, earners uh, levels? Uh, for instance, um, you know, we know there's been fraud in those who receive the child tax credit. What percentage of individuals who have filed for the ta child tax credit uh, have, have done it so fraudulently compared to high income earners. Do you have that information? I believe we have that and can get that to you. Yeah, could, could you share that uh, uh, with, with all of us? Uh, and I just, again, I want to caution you. Uh, you know, I have a lot of people who uh, do very well uh, and are proud to be part of America and part to, uh, proud to pay their taxes. And they don't want to hear from the IRS commissioner that he thinks that all of them are cheats. So I'd caution you in the language. Well, I, I would love to go on the record and say I do not believe all of them are cheats. But Thank I you. do get bothered when we see evidence of evasion. In, in, um, your, in your testimony, you've also characterized partnerships in the same way. That's deeply disturbing. You've said an increased audits of partnerships uh, is, is important because it, apparently, in your mind, partnerships, for some reason, are a category that is cheating more than others. It, uh, Congressman, what we're trying to do actually is bring our audit rate back to historical norms. It's been anemic. And I do believe that when we're not doing the requisite amount of audits, when we're not showing that we are ready to enforce, that that does increase the risk of evasion. And that's what we're focused I don't, on. You know, it's to the Congressman T uh, Sewell just mentioned targeting specific populations. I think that should go across the board. I agree. I don't want IRS to target any population. I think in all categories, most people uh, want to pay their taxes and are doing their best to comply with the law. And so I, I, hope, I agree with that. I hope what you're doing is a randomized uh, targeting, uh, a randomized looking at uh, audits or at uh, returns to ensure that uh, everyone is complying to the best of your ability. We're looking for spaces where we think evasion is proliferating and trying to hold people accountable for what they owe. A lot of too many of these organizations are shielding their income. That doesn't mean they all are. That means that there's more work to do for the IRS to make sure people are paying what they owe. Thank you. I'm out of time. Thank you, Mr. Ferguson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Warfel. Thank you for being here today. Um, I, I want to start with doing something that we probably don't do a lot on this side. I want to thank you um, for your help. When you were here last time, you gave us, you gave me your word that if we sent uh, some tough cases that had had no movement uh, that, you would, that you would help with those, and thank you for doing that. Um, I have another long list that I may just send your way because when you speak, uh, the, rank and file, the rank and file under you seem to move. So um, I just want to say thank you for, for the help on those other cases. Um, two things I want to touch on. Number one, the, the problems in the employee retention tax credit um, have been well documented and well discussed here today. This committee, um, in a bipartisan way, along with the House, passed, passed a pretty significant piece of legislation the other day, and, and at the heart of it was dealing with the employee retention tax credit. Can you speak to how important that legislation was into, in, into preventing the fraud and helping the IRS fix, work through the legitimate claims on that? Can you speak to that, please? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the, the, the legislation that's under consideration, for example, that would prohibit ERC claims from coming in after a date certain. I mean, one of the things that impacts our ability to make sure that we're getting to the eligible claims amongst the ineligible is the size of the inventory. And the more our inventory is flooded with ineligible claims, and right now, we're still, like, we, once we issued the moratorium, the influx of claims dropped in half, but it's still, I think we got, 17 to 20,000 last week. So we're still, that inventory is growing. 
and it's growing with a lot of ineligibility. So we're going to putting a, helping us pause the incoming at this point so we can find those that have submitted that are eligible, we need that help. And so, and so again, stating that the legislation that we passed could provide a significant savings to, to the American Absolutely. taxpayer. I believe that. Thank you for that. Um, next item, and my colleague from Pennsylvania, Mr. Smucker, touched on this, and as he was talking about it, I said, I think he looked over here and looked at my notes. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we, we talk an awful lot on this committee about, and we debate going back and forth with these complex corporate tax returns and high-income earners, um, but we, we know that there is a tremendous amount of fraud in the um, earned income tax credit space, child tax credit space. Um, if you had to look at what you think the corporate fraud is versus the total dollar amount on, on the earned income tax credit and child tax credit, either through improper payments or fraud, wh how do those two numbers compare? Well, I actually think they're both important. I don't have the side-by-side -side ledger in front of me. Okay, all right. So, but they're, they're both important. Both material. All right. So, you're, you, you have said that you need money to beef up audits for partnerships, complex tax cases where evasion um, is more likely, right? Yes. Okay. How much effort are you putting into, and would you recommend that we look at reforming the, the tax preparer space and going after the folks that actually are committing fraud at the lower end of the income spectrum. Yeah, I, if, I, if, if they're both there, I haven't heard my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, they, they have been railing against corporate America and high income earners, but they lack the same religion when it comes to going after people that cheat the system in the earned income tax credit space. I, I'll tell you, Congressman, what, what, what's very motivating, and I mentioned it in my opening remarks, protecting honest taxpayers who are being victimized uh, and, and the tax system using, using them to victimize. So the example that, that drives me crazy and I wanna make sure that we address it is a, a nefarious preparer who, who uh, coaxes an innocent taxpayer in, promises them uh, an earned income tax credit quickly, whereas they could get it just as quickly from us, and then uh, rips them off in some way, shape, or form. Sure, the, 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 pr the predatory, uh, predatory lending practices that go along with this um, are, are pretty grotesque. And, you know, I would love to work with our colleagues on the other side of the aisle on a really meaningful piece of bipartisan legislation that goes after the folks that, that, yes. that really are committing the fraud at the lower end of the spectrum. Um, it's important. I, look, I'm, I'm sort of like my friend from Pennsylvania here. We want the IRS to do its job. We believe that audits are, are important, and, but they should be fair and they should be non-discriminatory, and they should be at both ends of the spectrum. Yeah, so understood. That, and that's, that's a first principle we have. We want, just like with the high income, where there's nefarious activity, for sure, where there's blatant disregard and purposeful evasion, for sure. And at the lower end of the income bracket, when we have nefarious actors like the one I just described, that's where I'd like to focus, rather than uh, an audit program that impacts too many honest taxpayers. With, and I'll go back to this, with the right investments, we can be I, I, more look, surgical. Look, no, no, look you, you, what you just said, excuse me, Mr. Chairman, I know my time, I'm over my time, but when you, you got to have a program that's fair for everybody. You talk right. about just going after the preparers, you have to also go after the individuals that are knowingly um, defrauding the system. And with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, my time has expired. Thank you for the indulgence. Thank you. Ms. Del Bene. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Commissioner, for being with us today. Um, after years of ne neglect through decreased appropriations, the IRS finally received the influx of resources it needed to improve and update its operations. In the year and a half since the Inflation Reduction Act was signed into law, we've seen the impact of these resources. Um, some of these successes include call time responses decreasing from 28 minutes to three minutes, the backlog of 2022, individual returns now cleared and launching new digital tools to help taxpayers. Yet, unfortunately, Republicans want to continue getting the agency's funding, so we should be ensuring the IRS has multi-year sustained funding to continue building on these successes. Um, 
Mr. Commissioner, I wanted to know if you could speak to the IRS's enhanced enforcement efforts and specifically how the use of AI is helping to identify non-compliant taxpayers. Yes, yeah, so this, thank you for the question. And um, we have to make investments to make sure that we are precisely finding where the evasion is most problematic. And in particular, in these complex situations, for example, with money moving across international jurisdictions, money moving into uh, wholly owned subsidiaries, it can be tough to find where the evasion is. And we can invest in AI-powered analytics to really better understand and increase the likelihood that we're seeing the evasion and selecting the right cases for audit. And so that's where these investments are going, into making more sophisticated models to make sure we're selecting the right cases and finding the evasion where it is. Thank you. Um, one of the issues I've heard about from my constituents uh, is about the lack of clarity on IRS notices um, that are sent to taxpayers. Often the notices are very complex. Uh, they're from the IRS, so people are very concerned about them. They leave taxpayers confused about how to resolve the issue. Um, so what are some of the changes the IRS is implementing to the notices and letters that are sent to taxpayers? How can these changes benefit yeah. taxpayers? And how has IRA funding facilitated these reforms, if it has? Yeah, I mean, this is such an important uh, piece of the puzzle. Uh, we've launched uh, what we call the Simple Notice Initiative. Um, we send about 170 million letters or notices to taxpayers each year. Uh, and if you look at them, they need a lot of improvement in terms of their clarity. And we've run a program, we've, in the last year, we took 31 high volume notices, redesigned them, um, you know, and, and they're, they're significantly better, and we're getting very positive results on these. And now heading into 2025, we're now scaling. And so by next filing season, so when I'm sitting here next year, if we're successful, 90% of the total volume of notices will have gone through this effort and be redesigned and simplified. And we anticipate that's gonna be very beneficial for taxpayers. In some of the early results that we're seeing, uh, taxpayers are going to our online tools and using them more than calling in the call center. That means they're getting faster responses. So very positive results just from clarifying what we're asking taxpayers to do in these notices. No, hugely important, and um, so thank you for that. Um, also, federal and state laws require professionals like doctors and lawyers to not only obtain licenses or certifications, but also to pass competency tests. And while some tax return preparers must meet licensing requirements, many tax return preparers do not have minimum competency requirements and therefore are not credentialed. Um, Commissioner, I was wondering how taxpayers who use non-credentialed preparers are harmed by doing so, and how would establishing minimum competency standards help protect taxpayers? Yeah, this has come up a few times in the hearing. You know, we do have a risk with preparers that are not serving their clients well or their customers well. In some cases, just not providing appropriate and suitable tax advice. Uh, in some cases, uh, actually stealing from them, or in some cases, leaving them with a financial mess on their hands. And so more can be done. And we have, uh, the administration has put into the president's budget uh, previously changes that would allow us to uh, require more credentialing of these preparers uh, before they would be able to uh, provide uh, tax advice or preparation services. I think it's an important thing because people are being victimized, and as I said earlier, one step the IRS can take in partnership with Congress to show that we're on the side of taxpayers is disrupting those moments of victimization. And this is an, an idea and initiative that could do just that. Thank you, my time's expired. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Estes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you to Commissioner Werfel for uh, joining us today. I mean, we're 60 days out from Tax Day 2024. Kansans I represent are working through their tax season tasks, whether it's uh, preparing to file their individual tax returns or filing business forms. I mean, the fact is everybody has to interact with the IRS. An agency really should have a customer-focused prerogative that puts American people first and not the own interest within the agency. 
I'm also concerned about, uh, like my colleagues here, uh, about some of the inflammatory accusations that certain groups of Americans are automatically considered to be tax cheats. Uh, my career prior to, to running for office was looking at how do we provide good customer service, how do we make business operations more efficient. And unfortunately, it seems like uh, uh, the, a lot of the D.C. bureaucracies uh, focus more on how to make things easier to push paper or, or work from uh, Johnny's desk to Sally's desk uh, instead of focusing on how to, how to be more efficient and, and meet the needs of American taxpayers and any constituents and provide that quality, timely service. Uh, Mr. Uh, Commissioner, I'm, I'm sure this doesn't surprise you, but my office in Wichita receives calls each year from constituents who have issues with the IRS. I mean, just this month I received a letter from a small car dealership issues e-filing their 1099 NECs by January 31st deadline through the Information Retrieval Intake System, or the IRIS. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to submit this letter from Luber's Cars for, uh, for the record. Without objection. You know, the controller at Luber's car told my office that while they started in the middle of the month, the e-filing and IRIS portal continued to crash, causing major delays and pushing them right up to the deadline. But the situation was not unique to Luber's cars, who assured me that they have the top-of-the-line high-speed internet. They reached out to the Kansas Automotive Dealers Association, who informed them it was a widespread issue. Luber's tried to portal at multiple times during the workday and evening with no avail. The CPA indicated that they were receiving calls as well. Finally, around 6 a.m. on January 31st, the deadline, they successfully were able to uh, submit the required 1099 NECs. Commissioner, as, as you know, the next deadline is March 31st. Are you aware of these issues with the IRS portal, and what are you doing to make sure that this critical tool is ready uh, for the upcoming heavy usage as more small businesses file now that you've got this money uh, to Absolutely. have these upgraded systems? It's a, it's a great question, um, and it's... It's definitely on my radar screen. It's, it, it was concerning while it was going on. This is, you know, we have a lot of different portals, tools, technology out there. And, you know, anyone who's uh, in, involved in running these systems will let you know that they don't always perform perfectly. The key is what your reaction time, your speed, your troubleshooting is. And when it happens, do you learn from it so that you prevent that type of mistake from happening in the future? And, and that's what I'm trying to instill in the IRS. And so we were working the problem, are working the problem, made the necessary adjustments to allow these uh, information returns to be submitted successfully. Um, we are monitoring it very closely because of what you said. And um, I'm cautiously optimistic that the changes and the updates that we made will allow, allow for a much more stable platform as we get to the busy season. Well, the Luber's controller called the IRIS help desk multiple times and couldn't get through. You said earlier you've hired 5,000 new uh, call agents to help with that. And so this letter is just uh, two weeks, less than two weeks ago. And, and so have, have all IRS agencies, uh, employees returned to the office for five-day work weeks since COVID? I know the GAO issued a report this fall that uh, uh, high percentages of offices across all agencies, not yes. just the IRS, had not returned to the office. And uh, what are you going to do or what are you doing to help make sure that taxpayers who are trying to do the right thing can get through to work with your agents and other, other employees? Yeah, so uh, first clarify, all IRS employees are working. Um, the, uh, the objective is to make sure that we're getting the mission done. And when you tell me that uh, someone didn't get through on the phone line, I want to learn more about that and figure out what we need to do. There is a government-wide standard out there in terms of uh, where we stand today, what should be the percentage of uh, in-office work versus remote work. The IRS is generally consistent with that government-wide standard, but we're constantly evaluating uh, any steps that we can so, take. So, sorry to interrupt, but what is that, before I run out of time, what is that governmental standard for the IRS for the number of employees? Well, the government-wide standard is 50% is, is, is the government-wide standard. Six, so 60% so of not, the employees it's, it, come Everyone's to working. It's 50% on-site versus 50% working in some remote uh, location. So how can somebody in a remote location be handling niche tax returns? I, that just seems to me that it's not doing the job that needs to be done to help service American constituents. I'm happy to walk you through in greater detail, but we have many, many employees on site doing the exact work that you described. Um, and, you know, in our campuses where a lot of our processing of taxes goes, that's where we have heavy, heavy presence of IRS employees. Thank you. And my time's run out. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll you back. Ms. Miller. 
Thank you, Chairman Smith and Ranking Member Neal, and thank you, Commissioner, for agreeing to appear here today. I've been looking forward to discussing the IRS's actions with you for some time. I'm extremely concerned that the IRS has been just a little too focused on following political directions of the Biden administration instead of fulfilling its congressionally mandated duties. The continued delay of the 1099K threshold, an announcement of a new threshold, is an illegal overreach that is not found anywhere in law. Unfortunately, this is just another step in a long string of illegal and questionably legal actions taken by the IRS and the Department of Treasury to either willfully ignore char char the change or misinterpret the laws that have been passed by Congress. Why was the IRS unable to implement the $600 1099K threshold passed in the American Rescue Act? I'm really glad I have an opportunity to respond to this question, Congresswoman. Um, I believe the IRS commissioner has the authority to implement laws in a manner that ensures taxpayer rights. This means that in, at times, implementation is delayed or ramped up over time in order to make sure that we're achieving that balance, that we're implementing the law that was enacted by Congress, but also abiding by another a responsibility we have under the law, and that is to ta protect taxpayer rights. In this situation, the, this outcome of delay or ramped implementation was strongly recommended by a diverse set of stakeholders across tax industry, commercial industry, from every direction we were hearing calls to, uh, that, that there was risk. What well, was I the, can understand yeah. why. Yeah. I mean, given the three-year extended delay, does the IRS believe it will ever be able to comply with this law? We're working with stakeholders on a path that will get it done, and in particular, that's why we are, begin, we, we are intending to begin implementation next year. Again, the, the, the focus that I have and we have at the IRS is how do we do this in the best interest of taxpayers? We don't want taxpayers overpaying their taxes. We don't want them confused. We don't th want them bombarded with forms and paper they shouldn't be receiving. And if we go forward with implementation without being able to adequately protect against that risk, then I'm not meeting my legal responsibility as commissioner to help taxpayers and to help protect their rights. Well, in November of 2023, you announced plans for a threshold of $5,000 in 2024. Yes. Who specifically made that decision to set this new threshold? That was a strong recommendation from the stakeholders we reached out to across a, a variety of stakeholders, taxpayers, these companies that are, are third-party payment platforms. The reason why there seemed to be consensus on $5,000 was because that, if you looked at the analysis and the model, $5,000 would ensure the most revenue would be impacted while also protecting the most taxpayers from unnecessary paperwork and, and, and sending them things that they didn't actually need. Well, so, I have yeah. to reclaim my time because, I mean, what authority does the IRS have to set the new threshold? The authority. So we have an authority under the code to administer laws consistent with taxpayer rights. And so this happens from time to time. Oh. Our, our goal and our objective is to implement the laws on day one. Yes, but th there are many. We write the laws. Yes, Congress but, writes the laws. But there you are, don't. There are a variety of examples throughout history where the IRS, in order to protect taxpayers from undue burden or from potentially being overtaxed, where we have either delayed implementation or ramped implementation. This is not the first time, and I'm not the first commissioner that has confronted this tension. But they're uh, still illegal. Your actions are still illegal. It's not illegal to take a step to protect taxpayer rights. Well, anyway, I'll move on from this. Another concerning action I have that the IRS has taken is the implementation of the so-called free file program. I mean, you've got to be kidding me. Nothing is free. Everything the U.S. government does is paid by taxpayer dollars. So nothing is ever free, and I, I, I don't think you should be wasting your millions of dollars when the private industry is doing a good job. But I do want to give you credit where credit is due. I commend the IRS where credit for the ERTC claims, for processing them. I understand that the system was devastated by fraud and abuse, 
which is why the committee in the House recently passed the Tax Relief for American Families and Workers Act in an overwhelmingly bipartisan manner. And I also want to urge my Senate colleagues to similarly follow suit so that the IRS can focus on credible ERTC claims so that good American small businesses can swiftly access the benefits that have been promised by Congress. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Congresswoman. The gentlelady yields back. I yield to Ms. Moore from Wisconsin. You're recognized. Thank, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Commissioner, uh, for joining us today. We've heard a lot of discussion today about the earned income tax credit and the uh, audits and the perhaps fraud that's been committed, and you were unable to sort of monetize the amount of fraud that that was as compared to corporate fraud uh, and loss of revenue. Um, I, I guess we've had estimates that there's like at minimum close to maybe 600 billion to a, a trillion dollars worth of um, lost income from corporations. Is that anything, even though you can't nail it down to the penny, is that anything close to what you're experiencing with the earned income tax credit? Just uh, <laughs> sort of a back of the envelope sort of uh, assessment? So we, we have a, a, a tax gap analysis where we can evaluate where the differences are between what is paid mm -hmm. versus what is owed. And the last uh, estimate that we provided estimated of roughly $650 billion a year yeah. in, in this gap. So are, are you guessing that maybe the earned income tax credit fraud or whatever, and I'm sure you can recover all of it since <laughs> it's not very complicated to catch an earned income tax problem. You don't even need a person. Probably the machine will find that. Am I, am I right or wrong about well, that? Well, uh, Congresswoman, for me, it's about priorities. Yeah. Uh, and okay. what, are our, what are our priorities within our income tax credit program integrity? And what are our priorities in terms of tax evasion amongst the wealthy? And that's what I'm seeking to establish. Okay, so let me go on because I hadn't really planned to talk about this. It's just that my colleagues have raised it. What would you say that the fraud rate for the earned income tax credit is as compared to the low uptake of it? The numbers of people who deserve it and could use it and don't... Um, don't apply for it. Is what is that number? Yeah, I, and again, I don't. I'm, I don't have the specific fraud rate. It's not okay. something that we measure. It's not fraud. I'm talking yeah. about the people who don't even exactly claim. I, I, and this is part of the challenge. We we believe that there is a material gap in the and number. I mean, there's millions of dollars left on the table. I Agreed. Think that that families and kids need, particularly since we have such a stingy child tax credit. For, you know, we have harsh requirements for TANF, uh, and people are living money on the table with the earned income tax credit. You know, um, I think, um, I believe it was uh, uh, my good colleague um, that, uh, that asked you a question about child support, and I think that in the absence of an adequate child tax credit and earned income tax credit low uh, uptake in that, that it's really important that we do child support tax collections. And I understand that these contractors have to be 6103 compliant, but we found this problem even with states that administer the child tax credit for tribes. And so I am wondering, um, you know, they're subject to these audits and I'm wondering how long that's gonna go on. It's really hurting tribal communities um, uh, and not getting these monies. Can you quickly comment? Uh, well, I would. I'm. I want to work with tribal communities directly. I know that tribal communities face unique challenges in terms of meeting their tax responsibilities or getting access to tax benefits. So if I can learn more about the specific issue, That's I right. would. That's right. Just learn about sovereignty, and that'll help you figure it out. Let me ask you some questions before my time expires. Very quick questions. I'm not asking you to opine on policy, okay? Yes. I'm just asking you to affirm some things that I think I already know. This essential government function um, test, is that an impediment to tribal nations' use of government bonds? Yes or no? 
I know it's something that uh, that is more in in a policy shop, but I, I do know, believe. I'm just, I'm just saying. I'm saying this is this is what we've heard from uh, from tribal communities, and that's why it's important to engage with them on solutions. So, so to the same issues. thing, because they're going to cut me off. I guarantee you, the new market tax credit uh, set aside for tribes, the low income housing tax credits, and you know setting aside a housing tax credit program, would that increase the effectiveness and administrability of these programs from the perspective of the IRS? It's something that I want to work with uh, and coordinate with Treasury and the tribal uh, outreach programs that they do and get back to you on that. Well, Commissioner, just let me join uh, the chairman, uh, the ranking member, all of my colleagues in thanking you for being here and being very, you've been very yeah. good and I want to appreciate you. And Congresswoman, I do now know that 20% of eligible taxpayers don't claim the earned income tax credit. So that means one in five, and that is something we have to address. That's a lot of money yes. that's left on the table. Absolutely. Versus how many frauds that you find. And of course, you can collect every dime of that money because it's not hard to audit an EITC recipient versus someone who has 500 corporations and billions of dollars. Thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. I gave you an extra 53 seconds. You just remember that. I, I'm going to remember that. Helping you out. All right, the gentlelady yields back. Uh, Mr. Murphy from North Carolina, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Commissioner, for coming today. I was just looking at your CV. I saw you went to Duke and to UNC. I did. So if you can answer one question today, Duke or UNC? Duke. All right, well, I got no more to say to you. <laughs> all right, all right, let's get down, actually. So Cal uh, questions, California and uh, North Carolina, excuse me, New York have the most uh, billionaires. And you're saying that that's a high rate of cheating. Have you ever correlated any of them with the Carolina? With, are they paying, paying the California taxes and the New York taxes? I don't have that analysis at my my fingertips. We're we're focusing. At, no, no. What I'm saying is because we're talking. You know, we're talking about a lot of folks not paying their taxes. Look, I, I'm 100 percent. People need to pay their taxes. Period. I don't care what uh, income bracket you're in. But if we're talking about millionaires and billionaires not paying their fair share, which is what we hear the president say a lot. Those are the two biggest states are in California and New York. So it'd be nice to know, you don't have to answer this, but it'd be nice to know, are they doing that for New York and California? And are their particular revenue departments going after them? Fair yeah. question. It is a fair question. And um, <clears throat> I would, <clears throat> excuse me, I would want to coordinate a response to that after talking to those, uh, those states. We are not uh, necessarily focused regionally. We're focused on the types of evasions I get that, uh, that corporations uh, are engaged in. Many of them are maybe operating in California, incorporated in Delaware. The, the reality is, is that the, the question yeah. is the underlying behavior. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, were you aware that the Biden administration has said that TikTok is not to be allowed on uh, government devices? I am aware of that, yes. All right. So this is, uh, this is just very troubling to me. So Office of the OMB issued guidance February 27, 2023, agencies were how to implement this law. DIGA found that 23 devices used by IRS still had access to TikTok, and uh, this is still troubling. It took the IRS, the, it, the, this thing was issued, um, TIGA, TI, TIGTA issued this to the IRS in May. <clears throat> the IRS did not take action until August of 2023. How, why? I'm not sure of the facts of that, but that does seem unacceptable, and I will get to the bottom of it. Do you personally believe, I think there are many members of Congress, especially uh, over in the Senate, Democratic uh, Senator Intelligence, Dr. Or Senator Warner, believes that TikTok is a security risk to this country. Yeah, uh, so I, I, I'm just yeah, saying yeah, this absolutely. is his word. It's generally considered a, uh, a risk, and I just, to the life of me, don't understand why these are still on devices. What really bothers me we're talking about folks working from home, is that the bring your own device policy for the IRS is still not enforcing this ban on TikTok. Can you speak to that? Well, I wanna make sure I understand the TIGTA recommendation and where we are in closing it out, but I absolutely agree, whether people are working remotely or working on site, 
we have to abide by these security standards, and any lapse is cannot be tolerated. So we need to be. It took eight months for the IRS to really update this policy. That's not acceptable. It wouldn't be acceptable in business. It shouldn't be acceptable in any government uh, agency. Um, let me ask you about the uh, criminal investigation unit and their access to TikTok, because it seems that um, they're kind of trying to get a, a, a waiver for this. Are you aware of any of that? I am, uh, I am aware of the fact that, uh, that in certain cases, when our investigative, our law enforcement division is, uh, is working to uh, uh, impede, disrupt, and hold accountable criminal enterprises, sometimes they have to use tools that, uh, to understand and, uh, and, and solve those crimes. So it's not, uh, it's a kind of an apple and an orange versus a, an, a, an IRS employee who should not have TikTok on their device versus a law enforcement official who's using Are you aware it. of that, uh, of that um, requisite, is that, of that uh, asking for this to for the uh, criminal investigation unit to have a waiver? I am, I am, I, I would want to get, before I got into more detail, I'd want to go back and get would more you, detail, but I am mind, aware of that, yes. Yeah, would you mind getting back to my office about yes. that? It's Murphy from North Carolina, um, who's a big Tar Heel fan, and by the way, yeah, I, I really am going to regret game. that answer. I, you know, I just was at UNC speaking, and I feel affinity there, but it's I, I'm, a long story. I'm messing with you. I'm messing with you. Just one last question. Artificial intelligence. You know, this is, this is the gold rush for, for this country and the world, for that, for that matter. Bias, absolute bias, will be a, a thing we're going to have to fight. And I hope that given the, you know, some of the biases that have been stated by the department, some, but some individuals, um, that we're going to, that, uh, that I have your commitment to do your very, very best that the IRS does not have any biases when using artificial, artificial intelligence in looking at who to audit, who not to audit. Because we saw that. Uh, we saw that going after Republicans before. We saw some real problems with who were audited. And artificial intelligence is a tool but it should not be used as a political uh, as a political weapon in the IRS. You have my commitment. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Gentleman yields back. Next, uh, Mr. Kufsoff, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner, for appearing today. I'd like to go back, if I can, please, to the GAO report that Congressman Estes was asking about. This is the one dated July 13th, 2023. The title of it is Preliminary results show federal buildings remain underutilized due to longstanding challenges and increased telework. If I can, just let me read maybe two sentences. 17 of the 24 federal agencies in GAO's review used an estimated average 25% or less of their headquarters building capacity in a three-week sample period across January, February, and March of 2023. On the higher range, agencies used an estimated 39 to 49 percent of the capacity of their headquarters on average. Do you know on an average day, Commissioner, how much of your headquarters building is being used? In Washington, I don't have that number at my fingertips. Would you say it's less than 50 percent? It may be because, the, as I mentioned earlier, overall the IRS is roughly in line with the government-wide standard of 50 percent. So because it's an average, it may be under. Um, we've heard different things and uh, questions today to you from, from members. Anecdotally, subjectively, what I, what I hear from my staff and from C CPAs and practitioners that have to reach the IRS is that it's a real struggle to get a hold of somebody. And, and you talked about earlier um, some of the challenges with the phone, the, the callback, which I appreciate. Yes. I would contend, respectfully, that not having employees in the office and having them work remotely presents challenges not only to your agency, but to the people that have to interact with it. Would you agree with that? I would agree that it, it, that it depends on what the function is. 
There are moments, for example, when uh, whether it's a weather event, streets are shut down, we don't want to lose productivity. So we set people up to be able to work remotely where they can. I would also... I get if there's a weather situation, but if we're talking about a day where the weather is fine, wouldn't it make more sense from a productivity standpoint to have employees physically present at the IRS and working remotely? In some cases, yes. In other cases, it's less relevant. I can give you examples of where it's highly relevant. Yep. For example, in our taxpayer assistance centers, those are our walk-in centers, and those are fully staffed five days a week. Everyone's there at all times. Also, if you visited and you're all invited to come to one of our campus locations, and you'll see employee, those campuses teeming with employees that are opening envelopes and doing other things to manage the tax system, and those, those individuals have to be on site and they are on site. Well, For me, what I look had, at is- We've a number of questions here about security. and we've all, We're all concerned about it. I know you're, yes. you're concerned about it, whether it's Mr. Little John or whatever as it relates to taxpayer information. From a security standpoint, wouldn't it be safer and more secure to have taxpayer information accessed at an IRS office versus an IRS employee's home? We, there are steps that you can take to ensure appropriate security, whether the, tax, whether the employee is in a SCIF, in a non-SCIF, or remote. And we have to make sure that we're securing, because there may be situations, whether it's a weather event or otherwise, or a pandemic, where we have to ensure the right level of security regardless of where the employee is. Can I, it's a true statement that IRS employees, when they are working remotely from home, can access taxpayer information, right? Certain employees, depending on the need, yes. Nothing to prevent the employee's 19-year-old son walking behind the screen from taking a screenshot of whatever's on the screen, correct? That would be a violation of that employee's responsibility to protect uh, information. There would be significant consequences for that, and therefore uh, virtually all IRS employees are very rigid in how taxpayer information is handled, whether it's handled on their computer screen in a remote location or on an IRS site. But it's true that that situation wouldn't occur if that employee were in the office, right? That, I don't uh, want to engage in hypotheticals, but that well, one, that, yeah, that, that doesn't that make employee, sense. That employee's 19-year-old yeah. son would Correct. not be physically, right? But there could be a visitor in the building. That's why, that's why um, uh, it's so important that whether you're on site or you're at home, that you are extraordinarily careful about who has visibility to information that you only, you're the only person who should have visibility. And I can cite other examples, just like I did about the 19-year-old son in, in, in the home. Um, there's no doubt, though, that situation wouldn't occur if that employee were in the office, in the IRS office, correct? What I'm suggesting is uh, yeah, hypothetical. You, I'm not, I don't want to engage in hypotheticals. Yes or no, and then I'll allow you to finish. The I, I, I feel like it's dangerous to go into hypotheticals because then someone's going to turn around and ask me, what if someone has a take your daughter to work day and they're w walking through the office? So there are all these situations. My common denominator bottom line is that each employee must rigidly and relentlessly protect that information from unauthorized access from any 19-year-old, whether they're visiting their parent in the office or whether they're at home. Let the record show that you were non-responsive. Thank you, Commissioner. Fair enough. The gentleman yields back. Mr. Schneider is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Commissioner Werfel, for joining us today. Uh, I want to start by saying I have appreciated working with you and your staff who have been uh, very helpful with us in, in dealing with uh, our constituent questions. Before I go to a question, uh, let me touch briefly on casework. We've been in touch with your team on a, a handful of IRS cases that we've been able, unable to make headway uh, as, as we are hoping. Uh, can I just get a commitment that we'll continue to work on these to, to try to get them done? And uh, I will go back to the previous. My kids are now uh, 29 and 30, but and I worked in a, before coming to Congress with uh, a lot of uh, confidential client information. Whether my kids were visiting me in the office, as they often did, or I was working at home, as I often did, it was imperative that I kept that information uh, confidential. And I think what I heard you saying is that that's the expectation of IRS employees, that 
information is, is yeah. kept confidential, irrespective of where they are, who might be visiting. One of, their concern, one of the reasons why I was struggling with the question and the hypothetical is I don't want to signal to any IRS employee that they can let their guard down no matter where they are, whether they're at home, whether they're at the office. It's absolutely critical that we have rigid policies and procedures in place to prevent unauthorized access. Right. And that's what I really want to emphasize. Thank you. Uh, I just make that clear. Um, let me also, I'll, I'll take another minute. Uh, we've talked about the IRA and the impact it's had, and you've touched on some of the things, but you know, the handful of things, I'll let you reiterate them, that the progress made. There's been t discussion of here saying it's not quite perfect, but I'm going to focus on pr progress, not perfection. Where's the progress we've made over yeah, the Yeah, things are trending years? in the right direction. I, I don't think there's any way that I will rest and come up to this table and say we're done, we're not done. And I want to hear about the taxpayer concerns, but I also want to recognize the before and after of a funded uh, tax agency versus a non-funded tax agency. And the before and after is stark in terms of what we're able to deliver in terms of taxpayer service. Um, and that means if we're funded, our walk-in centers are open. We can have Saturday hours. We can have special events where we're um, training people about how to use their, uh, how, to, how to get free assistance. Webinars are in place. All these different resources that we can invest in reaching out to taxpayers and helping them meet their tax responsibility. Is, is the difference of 85% of calls going unanswered and 85% of the calls exactly. now being answered? Exactly. And the other thing that I haven't had a chance to emphasize as much as I'd like to is the before and after of being funded in terms of what we can do to, to protect honest taxpayers from scams and the perpetrators that are involved in them. And if we're not funded, we're on our heels. The tax system remains complicated. It remains a playground for scam artists to exploit honest taxpayers, scare them, call up someone who's elderly, pretend they're the IRS, convince them to take out their credit card and pay a phantom debt. An underfunded agency, an underfunded IRS, means that that can be uh, exploited more and more. A funded IRS means we can work to disrupt those types of scams. We can increase our education. We can work with local partners. And we can put tools on the web so that you can either help your elderly parent or that elderly parent can have access to figure out, is this really the IRS? These are tools that other tax jurisdictions are putting in place, and we absolutely have to, in order to protect taxpayers from these risks, put these tools in place, and if we don't have the funding, we can't do it. So these are the choices that we Thank have. Thank you. So if we don't fund and we can't protect uh, those taxpayers, they're, they're at the short end of the stick. They're exactly. put at risk. At the same time, you, you've said there's a $650 billion, estimated $650 billion per year tax gap. Tax is not being paid. Who really suffers when uh, people... Uh, uh, cheat on their taxes, don't pay uh, what they owe? It's the people who pay their taxes, because they're shouldering the broader load for funding the government and its critical operations. Right. So and that's why it's so important to have equity. And that's why it's important to prioritize uh, our enforcement efforts for where we think evasion is most problematic. And the point that I've been making today is when I arrived at the IRS, after years of underfunding, I asked the team, where are we most exposed? Where are the risks the highest? Where has this underfunding caused the most damage? And one of the key areas was our ability to keep pace with complex tax situations where evasion was a risk. There are complex tax situations where evasion is not a risk, and that is a place that we will not focus on, but it's the place where there's a, a risk of it. Yeah, and I'm at the end of my time, so I'll ask the question, and, and actually I would appreciate a, a, an answer in writing, is. What is it that makes a complex return, and why does that complexity increase the likelihood or the ability of people to uh, avoid paying taxes that are owed? And yeah. uh, I'd like to be able to sh share that. Well, I, I just a quick example would be if you're operating in multiple countries, right. and they have different tax laws, and you're shielding your profits in the U.S. to get a lower tax, when the reality is that your economic activity is in the U.S., and you actually owe, and you shouldn't be moving uh, and making it look like to the IRS that your activity is elsewhere in a, in a more tax advantaged jurisdiction. That means that those that are act accurately reporting their profits, the companies that are, are paying a, a larger share than those that are cheating the system. And it's not just companies, it's wealthy individuals who are able to shelter. Commissioner Werfel. Uh, yes, sorry about that, yes. I'm up, no, I'm up here. I'm, oh, nor I'm okay. normally down there. Oh yeah, okay, the, oh, I was the chairman, okay, got it. 
Um, an IRS consultant named Charles Littlejohn stole a trove of tax return data, including returns from President Donald Trump and a host of other prominent American taxpayers, and released them to multiple media outlets in 2020 and 21. Last month, I was pleased to see that Mr. Littlejohn received the maximum sentence of five years in federal prison for his crime. In addition to criticizing the Biden administration's DOJ for only bringing one criminal count against Mr. Littlejohn, Judge Anna Reyes told Mr. Littlejohn at his sentencing that his crusade to violate President Trump's rights was an attack on our constitutional democracy, and I could not agree more. What troubles me even more is that the IRS has taken far too long to implement the corrective actions necessary to ensure that other American taxpayers do not become victims of a rogue IRS employee like Mr. Littlejohn. The Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration recently reported that the IRS failed to ensure that all its sensitive systems provide accurate audit trail logs to monitor and identify unauthorized access. Essentially, TIGTA is saying that you did not know when sensitive taxpayer information was illegally accessed. I understand Mr. Neal asked you about this and you said that you guys have taken corrective actions since that report came out, was it last week, February 6th? Um, what specific actions have you taken, and have you taken all three of the recommendations that TIGTA made in their report? Yes, um, we've taken a bunch of actions. I'll be very quick just to kind of give you a flavor of them. We've reduced the number of users. We've put more robust encryption in place. We've strengthened our oversight. We have improved our access logs. We've eliminated more movable, uh, removable media. We've put in place tighter email controls, new printer controls. Um, and on and on and on. And I, on this point, this is such a critical point on the uh, audit trails in our systems. Um, TIGTA had identified, I think it was somewhere between three and 400 uh, systems in the IRS that had sensitive data that didn't have the appropriate audit trails. I required the team, I think it was almost like my third or fourth day at the IRS. I said, I want audit trails in every one of those systems consistent with TIGTA's requirements. That, those have now been done. We shared that with TIGDA, but TIGDA didn't have sufficient time to validate that we did everything we said so when, we did. So when, when was all that completed? That was completed by the end of the fiscal year, so around September 30th. So all of the three recommendations that um, yes. TIGDA is how you respond to TIGDA? Yeah, they're, they're evaluating. We, we've said we, we agree. We're making the changes. We've made the changes. Here they are, and TIGDA is now, thank you. We're going to evaluate and see if you've done it exactly the way we want you to do it. So they're re-examining whether, for example, our audit trails are as robust as we believe they are now. So they're re-examining. So I'm just trying to understand when, because their report just came out. Yes. So like, you, you've been there a year. Yes. When, when did you, and I mean, this goes back to the, the returns were leaked in 2019. It was published in 2020. Then Mr. Littlejohn leaked a second batch in 2020 to ProPublica, which was yes. published in 21. Obviously, you weren't there, so I'm not asking you to, to vie for what happened during that period of time, but you've been there a year. So is it your testimony today that since you've been there, this has obviously happened, you've started taking corrective actions on these audits? Oversight review from TIGTA, we've said, we've, it's like we've handed in our assignment. We've put in all the audit trails to the systems that you've identified needed audit trails, and they're reviewing that to ensure that we didn't miss any. So I wanna make it clear to the American people today. So the three recommendations that were in the report last week that they made, you are stating under oath today that those have been made by the IRS, all of the recommendations in the report. We've agreed with all the recommendations. I'm stating for the record that the audit trails recommendation has been done. I want to double, triple confirm that we're completed with the other recommendations, but they're all underway. Can you let the committee know? Absolutely. Um, how, when can we expect that information? I, I can probably get back to you uh, by tomorrow or Monday. Or Monday's a holiday, Tuesday. If you could give that to the chair to disseminate to the committee, I would Absolutely. It. In the 30 seconds I have left. Please. Um, we have, in my district, was decimated by Hurricane Ian. In the tax package we just sent to the Senate, which obviously isn't gonna pass by today, the extension deadline, um, all of the people in my district for 2022 tax year are now gonna be forced to, by today, file their extension and then have to do an amended return. It's my understanding that it's taking about 20 weeks to process amended returns. What assurances can you give all of the Americans in 45 states who've been affected by a natural disaster who are now going to have to file an amended return that it's not gonna take 20 weeks to get their money back from the IRS? Mm. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a challenging issue, uh, Mr. Chairman. 
the reason it's challenging, and I'm, this is not about making excuses, this is about just sharing the facts, is that our systems, while we are mo more modern and effective with original returns, we're still on outdated systems on amended returns, and it's more manual. And that's why if you file an original return uh, electronically and select direct deposit, we can get your refund in under 21 days. But if you file an amended return, that's a paper manual process, it takes a lot longer and it's, and it's unfortunate. Since I gave Mrs. Moore a little bit of extra time, I'll take a little extra time. So what are you guys doing to, to remediate that? Like, why does it require a paper return? Is there efforts in place to? Absolutely, yeah. We we're doing a bunch of different things. First of all, looking at our, leaning out our process to see if we can close the gap on those 20 weeks and also taking the steps to automate our, uh, our entire infrastructure. This is one of the reasons why the modernization effort is so important. We're also doing a lot more scanning uh, of, of all of these paper forms because in a machine readable format, we can move more quickly. Thank you for being here today. My time's expired. I now would like to recognize Mr. Fitzpatrick for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner. Thank you for being here today. Um, sir, as you're aware, the IRS uh, placed a uh, moratorium on processing of new uh, employee retention credit uh, claims through the year's end to allow the IRS um, to add more safeguards uh, to prevent uh, future abuse and to protect businesses from predatory tactics. Uh, in my district, uh, I have many businesses that are impacted by this and are reliant uh, on the ERC. In fact, uh, we have businesses that say they could not meet their payroll uh, because their ERC uh, had not been processed. Specifically, uh, my office's uh, constituent inquiries uh, where businesses are owed uh, in excess of a million dollars, preventing them from meeting their own payroll for their employees. It's my understanding that um, in October of 2023, the IRS issued a bulk taxpayer assistant order um, on hundreds of current cases involving ERC claims, uh, but that was months ago. Um, so could you just give us an update on where that stands? Yeah, we are, we are working hard to make sure that we can separate eligible from ineligible claims in the inventory that we have. As I mentioned earlier, it's challenging because we have a lot of inventory and a lot of ineligibility and we have to figure out uh, what's eligible and what's ineligible. We're making progress. In fact, since we issued the moratorium in September, we're averaging between 1,000 and 2,000 processing a week. So we're getting the eligible ones out the door. And I think since the moratorium, we're nearing a billion dollars of ERCs issued. So I think we're meeting our promise to make sure that the moratorium didn't stop us from processing claims that were received before the moratorium. But it's challenging because it's a very complicated program. Eligibility is uh, is, is tough to, uh, to weed out from ineligible, um, but, uh, but it's a focus point for sure. Uh, I wanna uh, jump to the direct file system uh, that the IRS has put in place. Uh, this committee has asked many times before what the cost of that program would be. Um, at least as far as I'm aware, it's still unknown at this point. Um, first, why did the, the IRS and Treasury feel it was necessary um, to create a direct file system when industry uh, already provides many of these options for free to taxpayers. And secondly, could you explain um, how you um, concluded and how the IRS concluded that they were authorized to do this, to create, maintain, and update a direct file tax preparation platform? Yeah, so um, we have, we believe, a responsibility and an authority under the law to make the tax filing process uh, easier, uh, and more uh, beneficial for taxpayers. As an example, if, you, if you'll allow, I mentioned earlier, we provide a callback option now. If you call in, so, and that took some technology. It wasn't rocket science technology, but we had to implement technology. We didn't have to go to the code and determine was there specific language in the tax code that says, IRS commissioner, you have the authority to offer a callback option in the <coughs> call center. So there's a whole dip set of, of different things that we can do for taxpayers to give them more options. It's not a mandate. I think it's a much different bar if I were up here saying I, as IRS commissioner, am mandating something. What we're saying is it's another option on the menu. And when we look at all the things we've offered to taxpayers over the years as the world has changed, we, at one point it was telefile, file your, your returns on the telephone. Now it's file electronically. 
there's always been this desire to evolve and understand how to meet taxpayers where they are and give them as many options as possible. And that's what this is. It's just an option. Do we know what the cost of developing and maintaining this platform is? We do. We have um, in, our, in our public report that we were required under the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, we included a cost chart that explained the cost and with, with different assumptions. If 5 million taxpayers were to use it, if 10 million taxpayers. But this year, this is really just a pilot. We're still studying it, and it's available in 13 states. It's going to be a, a relatively small pilot to, to assess whether this is something that actually should be added to the menu. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you so much for your uh, candor. Uh, it's always uh, refreshing giving the uh, enormous responsibility that, uh, that you have and just how important revenue is for the functioning of our government. Um, that's why, of course, we were uh, very much alarmed when uh, this committee uh, voted uh, to cut $80 billion out of funding to the IRS. What kind of an impact would a cut like that have especially at this time when we're concerned about the federal deficit, what would that, what kind of a cut would that have? Especially, and you've articulated very well trying to keep pace with all the technological changes that you're going to, while the same, at the same time humanizing uh, the IRS through your call centers and the ability for people to have direct contact with a human being. Yeah, I mean, between our budget was cut uh, year over year between 2010 and 2022. Um, if, if you add all that up, it's a 25% cut. Uh, our staffing size uh, shrunk to the same size it was in the 1970s. But over those same 12 years, uh, the tax system grew and got a lot more complicated, and we have a lot more to do. Uh, tens of millions of more filers, thousands of changes to the tax codes, new programs, new activities. Um, and, uh, and a very different world, uh, you know, a, a gig economy where we used to not have a gig economy and more global, uh, uh, globalization, movement of money, uh, new, new currencies, and it's just a dramatically different world. So when you take those two together and you underinvest over a period of 12 years while at the same time the job to manage the tax system grows, it's not a good formula. It leads to underperformance. And what I'm trying to emphasize here is the people that suffer are taxpayers. They suffer because the tax laws still exist. They still have these responsibilities, and it's a stressful experience. And when a problem emerges, if they can't get clarity from the IRS, if they can't get through to us, if they can't get their tax issue resolved, it weighs on them, it's burdensome for them, and it's stressful for them. And that's what's so heartbreaking about an underfunded tax agency. It means that we're not answering the phone. It means that our walk-in centers are shuttered. And it means that our digital tools are stagnating. And that's what it means when you, when you describe, let's pull back the IRS funding. It, it means that the IRS won't be able to function and help you. And if you're not pulling back the tax laws and the tax responsibilities, but you're pulling back the ability for the IRS to serve taxpayers, then the ultimate harm is to the taxpayers themselves. And that's my, my impassioned plea to make sure that we don't harm taxpayers by making it harder for the IRS to help them. I think you've articulated that very well. What I'm interested in as well is uh, because of the sophistication as we go forward, what does, what is the IRS up against when you're dealing with major corporations or people with great wealth, what, is an, what does it look like inside the IRS when you're dealing with a battery of attorneys, accountants, yeah. and consultants that are going up against government employees? It's, well, I start with the volume, right? When you look at the number of uh, audit personnel we had uh, the day the Inflation Reduction Act was passed, uh, versus the number of the highest wealth uh, filers in the United States. And I'm not talking about just above 400,000. I'm talking about the millionaires, the corporations with $250 million in assets. We, we break it into cohorts. And for the, at, at the moment the Inflation Reduction Act was passed, we had one auditor for every 150 of the wealthiest taxpayers in the U.S. And these tax returns are long and complicated. 
thousands of pages, sometimes hundreds of thousands of pages. So I like people to picture, like picture that one IRS uh, auditor or examiner backing in 150 truckloads of paper saying, I'll review all that, that's my job. So it's, it's a real volume challenge. So we had to hire more personnel you know, uh, to evaluate these, these returns, but also the complicated financial structures, the introduction of new currencies, the more movement of money into international tax jurisdictions, the proliferation of tax havens, all of it, we have to keep up with it. Exactly. It's, a, it's an investment that we have to make in our subject matter expertise. It's investment that we have to make in our analytics and our predictive modeling, because here's the other issue. If we don't invest smartly, we just start pulling audits, we're gonna end up pulling audits from people that are following the laws more regularly and then adding burden to them when they're doing what they're supposed to do. So precision is actually very important here and you have to invest to get that pre precision. Mr. Chairman, I think we should do a hearing at some point too on uh, the uh, what uh, uh, artificial intelligence means and what it will mean to our agencies, especially those that are guarding our privacy issues as well. But uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Commissioner. Thank you for your integrity and your candor. Mr. Larson, that's a great idea. So, um, <coughs> Mr. Harrington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner, thanks for being here. A um, couple things. One, uh, I'd like to have a conversation. We don't have to do it now with the, your team responsible for the uh, donor advisory fund uh, regulations. I want to understand them better. They may be right. They may not be. I have concerns about what y'all would think are conflicts of interest that I think the market uh, would uh, has already con uh, considered and, and, and already manages, if you will. Uh, so it's something yeah, I'd like to- I have to my commitment on that. Thank you. Um, so I'm sure you have been briefed about the question I have, which is the question I asked you uh, a year ago. I think you got a lot to keep up with. You did respond in a letter. I, I referenced in our conversation uh, a, a, a New York Post article that talked about the number of, of firearms and munitions that uh, you all have at the IRS and the number of armed agents. And it went through specific numbers, 3,832 3, handguns, 600 shotguns, 439 rifles, 15 fully automatic weapons. It, so it's very detailed. I don't know where they got their information. And I think an appropriate oversight role for us is to, as a check and balance and for the purpose of transparency to the taxpayers and to the people that we report to uh, in the People's House, that they ought to have some confirmation of, of whether or not those numbers are right or if they're different. <clears throat> you responded with a letter and said, the inventory of guns and, and ammunition is consistent with other law enforcement agencies. I, I find that an inadequate response. I think if the American people who we all work for ask uh, as a check and as a point of accountability on agencies with tremendous power, and with tre tremendous power comes, I think, great responsibility and oversight and accountability, they deserve a specific answer. What's in the inventory? How many armed IRS agents? I'm not suggesting that there might not be some level of, and, uh, of appropriateness, uh, uh, but just saying we keep up with the same standards, the same standards of who? The FBI, the ATF, the Border Patrol? I, 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 so I'm gonna ask you again, do you have the specifics of firearms, the number of armed IRS agents, and the inventory of munitions I think the American people ought to know that. And then we can discuss why you have it and why they exist and for what purpose. And again, uh, there may be an appropriate uh, uh, need. Yeah, I would love to answer this question. First of all, I do recall the letter. I believe the letter that we sent you had a link to a public report that has the information you requested. If it did not, then we will get you that public link. I, I added the point that it was consistent with other law enforcement okay. after providing the data. If I could, though, I think it's so important if you could allow me to, to just address some myths please. about IRS oh, and please. guns. First, the vast majority of IRS employees are unarmed and will never be armed. 
Uh, most IRS employees are customer service reps. I like to say they're armed only with headsets, phone headsets, and our, uh, most of our accountants armed, all of our accounts, armed only with calculators. 50% of them are, are home doing it instead of in their offices, but that's a different issue. Second, the only people in the IRS that would ever be armed are federal law enforcement officials who investigate crimes in the context of very dangerous scenarios, organized crimes, criminals operating on the dark web, narcotics trafficking, human trafficking, terror financing, money laundering. The idea of sending these law enforcement officials to go uh, execute a search warrant or an arrest warrant without being armed along with their other law enforcement colleagues is not something that would ever be a smart or prudent thing to do. Third, and this is about our inventory, I think it's important context, the actual discharge of any weapon by an IRS law enforcement official is extremely rare. But under federal regulations, we are required to maintain a minimum amount of ammunition for training purposes in order for them to be able to hold a firearm when they're executing a search warrant on a dangerous criminal. And so when you see the ammunition numbers in that public site, don't assume that that is ammunition that is used by the IRS ever. My it's really I just for training. I got five seconds left. Yep. I appreciate all that. Um, I'll look at that link. Please. If, if it's in there, I, then I may have missed it. Yep. If it's not in there. I will get you the data. You'll get me the specifics Absolutely. so we can share with the American yep. people so we can, you know, okay. That's good. Yep. That's, all I'm, that's all I need. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Tenney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I see the ranking member is up there, too, and thank you both for holding this hearing. And thank you, Commissioner. I know this is a long, long uh, morning and afternoon for you. And I just want to jump into a couple of quick things. So, uh, Commissioner Wolfel, is Israel continues to fight the war that Hamas started with a vicious attack on civilians on October 7th, 2023, which includes the efforts to recover hostages that continue to be held underground in Gaza. Disturbing demonstrations have swept through our college campuses and around our nation and here at home. Uh, many of these demonstrations have been explicitly anti-Semitic and some have called for the death of the Jewish people. This committee held a hearing in November where we heard from witnesses that explained how certain groups behind many of the events calling for violence against the Jewish people are funded through tax-exempt organizations. Multiple witnesses raised concerns that tax-exempt groups in the United States have ties to and may be providing material support to Hamas, a terrorist organization. Um, do you share my concern about the shocking rise of anti-Semitism on college campuses, particularly and across our society? Well, first, thank you for this question. It is a tough question and a tough issue. And I do share concerns. I find calls for hate. I find anti-Semitism. I find Islamophobia abhorrent, reprehensible, heartbreaking. Um, as I put on my commissioner hat, and, uh, and, and run the process of, uh, of a determining whether an organization is exempt or whether an organization should be revoked of their exempt status, we have a process that we run. And what I want to make sure is that we run that process robustly and effectively to make sure the right outcome happens. Right, I understand that. And also, our, along with my other Ways and Means colleagues, uh, we sent you a letter along with Secretary Yellen, as you know, asking yes. for a briefing on what the IRS and the Treasury are doing regarding the funding of anti-Semitism and particularly the funding of calls for violence against Jewish people and using tax-exempt organizations. And I understand that you are in the process of doing that and putting a yes, briefing together briefing for Yes, that briefing is us, happening, yep. Which we greatly appreciate. But um, do you share our concern that there could be money flowing, uh, particularly potentially international money that we can't track? Uh, flowing to uh, tax-free for these horrific purposes. I want to make sure that uh, exempt organizations are meeting their responsibility to operate for exempt purposes. And uh, there are certain activities that could mean that their exempt uh, purpose or their exempt activities uh, are should be revoked. Those typically orient around illegal activity 
And what I want to make sure is that we have a very robust process in place. We get a lot of referrals. I want to make sure that we're running those referrals down and having a, a good assessment and a good process to figure out what the right outcome is. Well, well, can you share with us any information about what the IRS and Treasury are doing about considering penalties, for example, revoking their tax-exempt status? Uh, for these groups that are engaged in this kind of violent contact, obviously many of these uh, organizations and many of these so-called grassroots efforts look very astroturf. They, they have assets well beyond what they should have or could have possibly in a spontaneous way. What, what can we see in terms of taking that uh, status away? I them? think this is an important moment in time, Congresswoman, for the IRS, Treasury, and other federal agencies to come to this committee and others and lay out exactly what today's process is, what the current law and regulations say, and to determine whether we have both a sufficient framework and is it being implemented effectively. And that's a conversation that absolutely needs to happen right now. Thank you. We appreciate that. And I want to just jump on one other topic that uh, my colleague, Mr. Fitzpatrick, touched on. And that is I have serious concerns about the direct file program and my constituents fear, and I think rightly so, the IRS being the judge, jury, and executioner of their personal finances. Uh, additionally, this program presents a clear conflict of interest, I believe, for the IRS, who should not be in charge of preparing taxes while performing other duties simultaneously, such as audits. And as you know, my home state of New York is already participating in this program. And another concern of mine is New York taxpayers could struggle to navigate between the two disparate systems and ultimately fail to file in the state or the, the federal. And uh, I don't know, I want, I want to know, what are you doing? To, I know you only have a few seconds left, but what are we doing to address this issue and this potential problem, especially as we're seeing issues in New York State? So it's, we are certainly not uh, uh, preparing taxes. This is, I want, you, you should let your constituents know. They are under no obligation to use this solution if they don't want to use this solution. Uh, we will determine through this pilot uh, the, the pros and cons of such a solution, and I'll be back before this committee to report on that. Thank you. We just want to make sure it doesn't become a mandate. Thanks so much. I appreciate your time uh, today, and thank you so much for the response and also action on this really important issue with Israel and Hamas. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kildee. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for recognizing me and to you and the ranking member for holding this hearing. Um, and thank you, Commissioner um, Werfel, for your testimony. I just want to start out by thanking you uh, and if you wouldn't mind conveying to your staff my gratitude. And when I mention your staff, I don't just mean your senior team that we most often interact with, but with every one of those IRS employees and all the field offices around the country who, uh, who do a really tough job under difficult circumstances. In one of my past careers, I was the county treasurer, the tax collector for my county, and I know that typically when we are interacting with customers who are, um, paying their taxes, they're not always having their best day. And, and I know it's a difficult job, and I just want you to convey my gratitude to them for the difficult work that they do. And the fact that in some cases they have to face, um, I think, unfair characterizations from some of the people that I work with here in this building. And I, I just want to express to you that I appreciate their work. Um, I'd also like to, to thank you for the difficult work that you did during the pandemic, your team. Because Absolutely. Obviously yeah. We're not in that position. Um, my constituent, constituents in mid-Michigan um, needed help getting in contact with the IRS just to deal with very simple issues. And I know we had some struggles there. And I think, thankfully, because of the investments that we have been able to make with the leadership of President Biden and, and uh, congressional Democrats, the IRS is in a better position, uh, much better prepared to provide the level of customer service that the American people deserve. And I know you're continuing to work to improve that, and I appreciate that very much. I'd also like to acknowledge the steps that you've taken to make this tax filing, to make this tax filing season easier for the people I represent by delaying the lower uh, 1099K uh, reporting requirement. Um, this delay will cut red tape for many taxpayers and allow the IRS to focus on ensuring that those wealthiest individuals that you've referred to a few times in this hearing and those largest corporations can no longer avoid paying the taxes that they owe. Uh, the investments that President Biden and Democrats made under the Inflation Reduction Act are also helping expand access to filing. And you've addressed this. I know it's been raised with, by a number of members. But as has been mentioned, this includes expanding the volunteer 
income tax assistance and the tax counseling uh, for the elderly programs, which for years have helped the working families that I represent get their taxes filed um, without having to pay a fee. I understand the point my colleague makes, but I think the point that, that you make is that we don't ask people to pay a fee for access to those. They're, they are supported by taxpayer dollars, but not an out-of-pocket fee in the moment that that need is made. Though those programs are operated locally by United Way back home for me. Yep. Um, so the VITA and TCE programs are really important to me. Uh, and I wonder, uh, particularly as helping people access the benefits that they deserve, the EITC and child tax credit, I wonder if you can describe the IRS plan to expand VITA and TCE and what effect you think this will have for the people I represent. Yeah, I appreciate the question. I think there is a concerted effort under our modernization plan, we call it our strategic operating plan, to meet taxpayers where they are, and in particular, to figure out how we can connect with vulnerable populations to provide them assistance, uh, often volunteer assistance, uh, so that they have a better understanding of their tax obligations, but also what credits uh, they may be eligible for that they're not receiving. Uh, how do we do that? Uh, first of all, I think it's absolutely important that we're on the ground. And so we're using uh, new funding to open more uh, walk-in centers, uh, to, um, to extend the hours of those walk-in centers, to have uh, Saturday hours, to have special events and taxpayer experience days. In those moments, we can really promote with other local leaders um, the presence of, of this opportunity to have a, a volunteer. And then other tax preparers to know that they can volunteer and be a part of our, uh, a, 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 of our cadre of volunteers that are doing such important work. Um, I mentioned earlier in the hearing, I participated in one such local event in, in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, where you had local leaders, taxpayers, volunteers, all uh, talking about the role of these VITA and TCE uh, 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 individuals in that organization and the impact that it's having. And we had taxpayers stand up and tell their stories and how life-changing it was to get the help. Um, and we need to do more of that. Uh, local news was there covering it. That means that we're getting more uh, visibility into these services. Simple things that we can do, like just, for example, we recently created a new uh, page on our website called Free Help. Uh, where, where we're trying to highlight and make it as easy as possible for taxpayers to learn more about these, uh, these clinics and these volunteers. Um, so there's a big investment and push to, uh, to reach out to communities and make sure that the IRS is there. And I also mentioned protecting from scams because it's typically, what's so heartbreaking about these scams and schemes is it's very often the vulnerable population that are exploited. Those that get that phone call from someone pretending to be the IRS and they don't have an accountant to call to look into it and they're, they're scared. Uh, and I want an IRS that can be there for them to, to help them understand that this is, this is a scam and you need to be protected from it and we want to be there to, to do that. Well, thank you, Commissioner. I appreciate your testimony. I appreciate the Chairman's indulgence. Uh, you have a tough job. The people at the IRS all have a difficult job. We have a difficult job, too. But at the end of the day, we all work for the same people, and I think we can continue to, to collaborate on ways to improve our service to them. I think we're all better off. Yeah, and I don't think I've given enough credit in this hearing to the amazing workforce, uh, uh, the IRS. And you mentioned it. The work they did during the pandemic was uh, – you know, I would say for them, they would say it's all in the brochure of being there when taxpayers need them. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, myths about the IRS. Uh, one that I learned as soon as I got there, IRS employees care deeply about serving taxpayers. They're passionate about it, and it's inspiring me every day. Well, thank you. With that, Ms. I really appreciate the indulgence. I yield back. Ms. Fishbach. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and Commissioner, thank you for being here today. Um, just wanted to um, talk a little bit about a report, and according to a recently released report from the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration, there's lots of long titles, yeah. um, entitled Quarterly Snapshot with IRS's IRA Spending Through September 30th, 2023. Um, but according to that, the IRS has spent $3.5 of the IRA funds. 
Um, of the $3.5 billion of IRA funds expended in FY 2023, approximately $1.6 billion occurred in the fourth quarter of FY 2023. This includes approximately $464,000 expended in FY 23 for the direct e-file. And I know that that's been mentioned before, but the e-file uh, return system. Now maybe, so you don't have to look up everything, but what I really want to know is how the IRS is deciding what to spend the money on and why has only 4.5% of the funds been spent, yet the IRS keeps asking for more money. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad. First of all, here's an update. We're at $4.7 billion in spent uh, to date. Um, we are spending it uh, in particular uh, early on on taxpayer service, uh, hiring more phone assisters, hiring more uh, p uh, live assisters in our walk-in centers. Uh, we are updating our technology in our call center, adding more voice bots and automated solutions to our, our call center. Uh, we are purchasing more scanning, modern scanning equipment, so we're moving paperless. Uh, I mentioned we are simplifying all of our notices um, uh, and we're doing outreach to taxpayers and underserved populations. And, and so, Commissioner, that's all that's all covered in that 4.5 percent, or the 5.5 4 .5 billion. 7. Yes, I mean, and there's other things going on in particular. And I spent a fair amount of time in this hearing investing in our infrastructure. But are that, you going yeah. to? Are you planning on expending those IRA funds on that? Because you keep asking for money, but yet only 4.7 Here, is what I believe. Here's saying. the issue and why we're asking for money. I mentioned it earlier, but it's really important if you allow. Our base budget, there's two parts of the IRS budget. We have a base budget to run our day-to-day -day train schedules, I like to say, and then the IRA money, which is all about modernization, closing gaps, improving taxpayer services. That base budget is underfunding the cost that it is to run the nation's tax system on a day-to-day -day basis. But we have to keep the lights on. So we borrow from the modernization fund in order to pay. And when we borrow from the modernization fund to keep our lights on, it means we're not modernizing. We're keeping the lights on, but we're not modernizing. So when I'm asking for more money, what I'm asking for for the IRS is fund our base budget, help us keep the lights on so that we can use that, those modernization funds to build the tools that taxpayers want. They want a call center that has a callback option. They want a call center that has more uh, voice bot technology so they can get to things done more quickly. They want web functionality that works like their favorite online bank account so that they can do all their transactions with us without having to call. Commissioner, yeah. um, I just wanted to, uh, in response to Mr. Kilday's Question: I believe yes. you mentioned the strategic operating plan, and maybe, maybe as you go on and on about all of those things that you're doing, maybe you could help me understand how that fits in there and how the spending fits with the with the operating plan. I'm sorry, I, with the with the operating. You, plan? you mentioned the strategic operating. plan. Yeah, strategic plan. operating plan. Yeah, that lays out our what I call our public to do list, and there's numerous items uh, in there, uh, arrayed by various objectives. Uh, to both modernize the taxpayer experience, to improve our, uh, our equity in enforcement, in particular to make sure that we're closing the gap on evasion in complex tax situations, and that we're investing in modern technology so that we avoid unauthorized accesses in the future. All right, well, and thank you, Commissioner. And, and I may follow up with some other questions in writing, but I do have one last question. Please. That I, I, last year, you responded to a question that I submitted on the record regarding your, abil your agency's ability to use the funds that Congress has given you to transition to new te technology. Your response noted that the progress the IRS was making with the paperless processing initiative how, uh, uh, However, I have recently heard repeatedly from a company that has been trying to find a solution that would allow them to submit thousands of forms electronically instead of submitting these forms in paper copies. Yet after over a year of trying to work with your agency, they have continued to struggle to make meaningful progress on this issue. And how is the IRS using its funds to proactively transition to a more efficient and technologically advanced system for processing taxpayer information? Because that's not showing. They I'll give you the 10-second answer. 
By this filing season, we committed to making every correspondence response digitally uploadable. We achieved that. By next filing season, we're moving to the types of returns uh, and forms that, uh, that your taxpayer is struggling with. We're making the investments to make this a reality. Okay, and we may end up following up with that because it, you know, given that they have been trying to work with the IRS um, to make things happen, and it's been very difficult for them. But so we may follow up with another letter. But um, with that, I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Winstrup. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, Ms. Werfel. Thank you for being here today. Appreciate it. Uh, I'd like to focus my time today on an issue brought to me by uh, constituents, uh, like who are encountering issues with the employer retention tax credit. Um, I, I do want to say that over the years, uh, my IRS advocate to my office, have, they've been outstanding. So I do want to applaud that, always responsive and helpful. Uh, I wish we didn't have to call as often as we do, but this is what we're talking about, these issues. But recently I was contacted by a constituent who tells me that their business is really in imminent jeopardy and will close, go out of business if they don't receive the ERTC funds that they had applied for. And while this constituent applied for the ERTC before the IRS moratorium, the backlog, I understand, of the ERTC returns has been, that has been created uh, results in this claim being trapped in limbo. Mm. And for him, he sees no end in sight as far as, and trying as hard as he can. Another constituent of mine has been waiting nearly two years, and yet while the IRS will not process his $14 million ERTC claim, they will process an intent to levy taxes on his business. And you can understand the conundrum there. So uh, it's kind of hard for the IRS to, to attempt to collect on this constituent's taxes when the balance would have been wiped out already if their ERTC claims were processed in a timely manner. Yeah. So one thing's holding the other. So I understand that this program has become rife with fraud and abuse, and I agree that enforcement action must be taken against bad actors, and I sympathize uh, with you there. But I'd like to ask a couple questions about what IRS is doing, can do to solve the issue for my constituents and what steps Congress can take uh, to be helpful as well. So I'll kind of bundle these Three, three questions, if you will. What is the status of the IRS's ERTC moratorium? How many claims are in the pipeline? And does, do you have a timeline for those claims filed before the moratorium? Yes. Um, so first of all, I appreciate you raising it. It's important that we understand where there's a constituent or a taxpayer, in particular where there's a potential hardship. They're, sit, they're, they're waiting on an eligible claim and they're pay, uh, facing a, an emerging hardship. That's why we work with our taxpayer advocate to try to bump up to the front of the line uh, those that are uh, in, a, in more of a crisis situation. And we've had some, some success with that. I think there's been some reference to that here. Plus, I want to learn more about every uh, these types of situations because other taxpayers may be experiencing and maybe there's some scaled solutions we can do. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we are making prog slow, steady progress. Um, since the moratorium has been issued, we've, uh, we've approved uh, nearly a billion dollars in ERCs. Uh, the challenge that we have is that there's a lot more in the inventory as we're looking to piece out which are eligible and which are ineligible. Um, I would expect that by this spring, uh, we would have uh, finish the work necessary to really kind of separate into the right buckets, and, uh, and we'll be able to, uh, to lift the moratorium in that time frame. Well, if there's anything that Congress can do, or in, in particular, congressional office can do, um, we appreciate that. And I was uh, wondering if passing the American Families and Jobs Act would help alleviate this. It, it absolutely would, um, for, for a variety of different reasons. Uh, uh, the situation that we have has a lot of unique uh, challenges in terms of, of the inventory, ineligibility, incentives that are being provided to certain promoters that are clogging the system and harming honest taxpayers. The bill that's been uh, passed by this committee uh, and the House uh, addresses a lot of that, and we're appreciative. Thank you. I yield back. And again, feel free to reach out to members of Congress if there's things we can do on our end or within our district offices. I appreciate that. Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Panetta. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Uh, Commissioner Wolfel, thanks for being here. Um, it almost seems like you're enjoying uh, answering the questions, which I think demonstrates that you're uh, pretty good at your job. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, as you know, we in Congress provided the IRS with historic funding to help close that tax gap, uh, the hundreds of billions of taxes that are owed but not paid. We also provided billions to modernize the IRS and improve customer service, which has already reduced call times, as we talked about today, and helped more taxpayers and professionals settle tax issues. Now, thanks to this funding, the IRS has already collected over a half a billion dollars in overdue taxes from delinquent uh, taxpayers. I want to remind all of my colleagues that tax collection isn't a tax hike, it is about enforcing the law. Now, the vast majority of middle class family constituents with W-2s and simple incomes pay what they owe, and so should everybody else at all levels. So thank you, and we're encouraged by the IRS efforts to recoup unpaid taxes and improve taxpayer service. I appreciate your work and your leadership at this point, Mr. Commissioner. Um, when I narrow down uh, my line of questioning to paid preparer regulations, uh, Susan Del Benny already hit on this, but let me delve a little bit more into it. The IRS Taxpayer Advocates Purple Book, which I'm sure you're aware of, has stated that over half of all returns are done by paid preparers who don't have any credentials to do so. I have a bipartisan bill, the Taxpayer Protection and Paid Preparer Proficiency Act, try saying that fast, would ensure that paid preparers meet minimum competency standards. It would exempt credentialed professionals like CPAs and enrolled agents or preparers that meet minimum standards from state education councils from any new standards. It's sort of the, that's the focus of the bill is on the worst act actors, as you know. While I know that the IRS would ideally be given full legal authority to regulate all preparers, would you support a compromise that mandated minimum competency standards targeted at those with no credentials at all. Yeah, I, well, I, I don't have the authority sitting up here to support a particular legislative provision. I have to get uh, with my Treasury colleagues to do that. Uh, as a general principle, Please. Uh, we, we, we lack uh, authorities uh, today to hold preparers accountable, uh, whether it's credentialing, whether it's when they uh, harm taxpayers, um, and uh, the president's budget each year has included an array of different uh, legislative changes that would enhance our ability to crack down on nefarious uh, actors that are doing these things or to improve the overall quality of taxpayer uh, service that, they, that people get from private uh, uh, tax professionals. So yes, we, we would love to work with you on the right set of legislation. I appreciate that, thank you. Well, one of the I'll call it penalties, I guess, as a former prosecutor, I can say this. One of the penalties, I think, that the IRS should have is the authority to revoke a preparer tax identification number, or P-10 as it's called, yeah. when there has been misconduct. However, there's been some due process concerns that have been raised. Would the, do you think you, I guess you can opine, uh, whether or not the IRS would support a system of due process for preparers who are facing P-10 revocation? Yeah, there is, the, the, the legislative proposals that I've mentioned earlier that were in the president's budget last year um, have new penalties uh, for, uh, for when there's an appropriation of a P-10 um, and, uh, and, and, and tackles the issue. Whether that uh, president's uh, budget proposal aligns directly with yours, I'm not sure without getting into the details, but I think it's a great starting point to have that conversation. Thank you. Okay, moving on to um, tax credits. Obviously, uh, we in this committee passed legislation that would reduce our carbon output by 40% by 2030. However, some of the credits, including those for microgrids, fuel cells, and linear generators, expire at the end of this year. And unfortunately, we're still waiting for final guidance on those credits. And that's leading to some taxpayers and constituents of mine being reluctant to make investments. Myself and Claudia Tenney, Representative Tenney, have been pushing to extend these new energy credits so that they encourage, not discourage, more clean energy and resilient energy system deployment. So in a blatant effort to garner evidence and support for my bipartisan legislation, does the IRS see greater utilization in tax credits when they have had clear guidance for a longer period of time? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank I yield back. Thank you. Ms. Steele. 
Thank you, Commissioner, for being here. And I really appreciate it that you've been here answering all these questions. The, you know, the United States tax system, IRS, and I know California because I came from the California Tax Agency and plus all other states. I know their systems are really different than Justice Department because when taxpayers, as soon as audits, audits, audits starts, taxpayers are guilty and they have to prove that they are not guilty. But you know, the report from 2023 found that no change audits were 13% of audits for those making between 100 dollars to $200,000. 25% of those making between $1 million to $5 million resulted no changes. And then 50% of audits making over $10 million result on no change. And then you just mentioned one of the question that uh, you are, one of your first priority is like, you are going after millions and billions, you know, uh, making wealthy individuals. And your specific mention that about 1,600 people, I just wanna know that you are targeting those people or they've been assessed but they are not paying taxes? They are, uh, uh, have been assessed a balance due that is now delinquent. So those are million, mil, uh, millionaires wealthy, and billionaires that have that a delinquent tax debt. Yeah. So those are including, not including those no result, I mean, no changes, you know, when after they did the audit, but these- No, these are individuals are that have, ha do have a balance due. It might not have been uh, after an audit, uh, but there's a balance due that's now late, uh, and uh, they're not paying unless we go and, uh, and, and enforce that they must pay. I'm glad that you're not targeting certain people out there, so thank you. Yeah. And we've, we've spoken extensively about your drive to increase the number of audits searching for evasion. Yes. And that's good. People have to pay taxes if they owe. But what steps are you taking to reduce these phishing expedition, no change audits mm. that burden taxpayers and cost the IRS time and money for no result. Yeah, that's a concern. We, we, wanna, uh, we don't want to have a situation in which we are selecting cases for audits where we should not have because the tax, uh, we want to leave those taxpayers alone. Uh, they should uh, continue to do what they're doing, which is uh, filing complete and accurate taxes. This is about making investments in subject matter expertise and analytics to make sure that we're selecting the right cases and then when we select them, when we have the return in front of us, that we can identify where there might be pockets or systemic uh, evasion. Um, and we have to get better at it. We have to become more precise. And to do that, it's about investing, as I said, in subject matter expertise, technology, analytics, uh, some AI solutions we've already be put in place. So then let's go back to this. The IRS must safeguard taxpayer information. A recent letter you sent Chairman Smith notes that IRS conducts background checks on employees and contractors. Correct. But the February 2024 Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration report notes that the IRS did not always remove contractors' access to sensitive systems when background investigations were not favorable. Especially 19 contractors' most recent background investigations were not favorable as of July 13, 2023, yet they still retained their access to one or more sensitive systems because of the IRS did not take an action to suspend or disable the contractors from the IRS systems as required. So why should the fact that IRS conduct background checks on employees and con uh, contractors serve as comfort if IRS does not take necessary actions to limit the access of those who failed background checks. Yeah, I, I really appreciate the question, and it's absolutely critical that only those employees or contractors who require or are eligible for access have access. And we are, first of all, with respect to those 19 contractors, we have resolved the issues with those 19 contractors. 
Um, issues came up during their routine background investigations. I can state unequivocally that there's no evidence that, they that those 19 contractors comprise sensitive information of any kind. The other key point is that when we eliminate network access, there is no more access to sensitive data. And, 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 and systemically, we have been able to eliminate network access. The issue is sometimes these employees still appear on a registry, like a time, like for timekeeping. And so it gets confusing. They, th that, that, that individual can't access sensitive data, but they're on some type of list somewhere. And when TIGDA saw that, they rightfully called us out. These people shouldn't be on this list, but they don't have network access. That doesn't mean I'm resting on any of this. We have to be as diligent as possible to make sure that only employees with applicable and timely access can have that access, and we're working that issue right now. Mr. Chairman, I have one more question on IT modernization following up that question, but you know what, my time is up, so I'm gonna submit in writing. Thank Perfect. you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Van Dyne. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to concur with all of the comments that were made earlier about the ERTC, and for the sake of argument, or for the sake of time, I don't want to be repetitive, but I published an op-ed piece that I would um, ask for unanimous consent to enter into the record. Without objection. So one of the new taxes that is included in the new tax uh, on chemicals is to fund a new super fund, and I have introduced legislation to uh, repeal this. The excise taxes were last imposed and collected in 1995, and there appears to be a lack of historic knowledge within the Treasury and the IRS as to the refund and credit process. I've heard from constituents that the IRS substantially delays processing refund claims and has initiated audits for each claim. For tax credit claims, we understand the IRS is denying the credit, requiring payment for the full super fund tax amount with no credit offset, and assessing penalties and interest for failure to pay, even though an offset or a credit is allowed by law. The IRS released proposed regulations on March 21st of last year, yet to this day the regulations have not been finalized. When will the rule be made, and what will the agency do to rectify these problems? Congresswoman, I appreciate the question. I, I, if you'll allow, I would like to go back uh, and make I, I sure don't, that it, I don't have a lot. I don't need the history. I'm just wondering when are you going to be able to finalize the rule, and what are you going to be able to do? To I will get back to you with issues. a response on that. So we don't. I, I mean, don't have a it's date. It's been over a year, right? Yep. Okay, we don't have. A, we don't have. I, I, I will. I want to get back to you with a specific time frame. Okay. Chairman Smith and the Oversight Subcommittee Chairman Schweiker wrote a letter on July 25th, 2023, requesting a copy of the decision memorandum detailing the recommendation to destroy 30 million unprocessed, paper-filled informational returns in March of 2021. The destruction of these returns raises the question of whether information reporting should be scaled back to reduce the burden placed on taxpayers in reporting information that the IRS does not even use. We still haven't received a response from you, and the original re response was requested by August 8th, 2023. That's 120, no, I'm sorry, 192 days overdue. So Mr. Werfel, will the IRS ever provide this documentation voluntarily, or should we consider, consider other means to obtain it? Oh, I apologize. Um, look, I, I, it's, it's very important that we're responsive to all congressional requests uh, for documents or information from this committee. So it's uh, been 192 days. Yeah. Tell me, will we be seeing that forthcoming, or do we have to issue a subpoena? I will go back and make sure that it's forthcoming. So that's a yes. Do we have yes. a date in which we can respect to have, expect to have a response? Uh, I will get back to you with, with a firm date. Um, so when will, um, I'm sorry, earlier, the chairman's questions, it seemed that you dodged some of them on sentencing of the IRS employee who stole the tax information of thousands of Americans. Thankfully, that individual is going to jail, but for a much shorter period of time than, than they should. How many individuals and entities had their information stolen? Uh, it's, I, I, don't, I don't want to quote an exact figure, it's way too many, uh, but it's in the tens of thousands. Do we know for each, for entities and for individuals? We have all the detail. Uh, yeah, TIGDA has shared us the information because we have a responsibility to reach out to the impacted taxpayers so that they have notice on the situation. So can you get us that information? Yes. And then have you ever asked ProPublica to return the stolen information? I believe that the Justice Department and TIGDA have done that. Do you know what's happening? I don't, I'm not, I don't have up-to-date information on that. So according to the Inspector General, for some sensitive systems, the IRS does not have adequate controls to detect or prevent the unauthorized removal of data by users. 
How is it possible that the IRS did not know the quantity of sensitive data systems under its purview? Yeah, that was the situation in 2017 when this unfortunate incident uh, occurred. Um, that is no longer the case. So what steps have been made to rectify that? We have uh, invested significant time, energy, and resources in dramatically changing our data security uh, profile. We've hardened uh, basically our security posture, including uh, introducing and implementing all the necessary audit trails so that if this uh, type of activity happened today, the risk of it succeeding is much, much, much lower. The probability of it succeeding is much, much lower. So at this point, we can expect that those, all of those safeguards have been put into, not just, just talked about, but have actually been implemented. There's a long to-do list, and we've made our way through most of it, but the to-do list keeps growing because the risks evolve. But yes, I would say you that- think the risks involved by having people work with their own devices and working from home? As I mentioned earlier, I think the risk is, uh, is both when they're in the office, when they're at home, there's always risk, and that's why we have to constantly focus on training. All right, thank controls, you. Controls, et cetera. Mr. Feenstra is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, Commissioner Werfel, for, for being here today. Uh, in April, you and I had a great discussion about the modernization of uh, the computer system. Uh, at the IRS, we know that this is, uh, you know, significant challenges. I think 33% of your applications are still on a legacy system, and and you know we continue to look at uh, our create policy. I'm thinking of book tax and stuff like that are very complicated. Um, so I, I just want to update a little bit. I, you know, the IRS noted that removing sensitive systems to a cloud environment will allow IRS to better monitor and use user of access data. I'm just wondering, where are we at on moving to a cloud system? Can you, yeah. you extrapolate on that? So there's two uh, fundamental or two main systems that underlie the IRS uh, infrastructure, the individual master file and the business master file. Okay. So that's where all the returns, when they come in, yep. that's our transaction record. We're close on the individual master file. We are uh, uh, months away, I would say probably April, May, June timeframe, of moving it into a fully modern environment, which is the final step before yep. it would go to the cloud. So it's kind of like so, on the to-do list to get it to the cloud. We have one more step. That'll make it cloud ready, and then it'll move to the cloud. So it, it, you're prognosticating here. When, when could we be cloud-based, you think? I want to get back to you on that. I know that the next key milestone is in the April-May time frame. How long from that point to a cloud environment? I have to get back okay. to you on that specific. And, and you know, I think about digitizing our data uh, and going paperless on a lot of these things. Would that Once we go to cloud, could we then go paperless? We're going paperless in concert with going to cloud, but yes, my, my, we have to still allow taxpayers the option to file on paper if they so choose, but we want to uh, turn convert that into machine readable before it leaves our mailroom, and that's the, we're, we're both purchasing the scanning equipment for that and updating our processes to make sure that we don't have paper anymore throughout the IRS. Gotcha, gotcha. So can you, do you have metrics um, that we're trying to follow here, saying, all right, we, and you just sort of mentioned it, right? We're going A, B. Yes. I mean, that, that, that we're trying to meet these metrics as we move forward? Yeah, we have the kind of what I call a critical path with our milestones, absolutely. Okay. Would you, uh, can, can you commit to me and the committee that, that you can get us that information, maybe quarterly statistics <laughs> on the progression of the various IT projects underway in the IRS? I mean, this is sort of the first time we're hearing where this is going, and I would love to know, all right, you know, just, Again, it's accountability. Hey, you know, this is where we're at. This is uh, where yeah. we're at this quarter, next quarter, and so forth. Can you? Yeah, I would love to do that. Not only uh, what path we're on to get to the cloud, but also as important, if not more important, what does that mean for taxpayers? Yes. What does it mean that we're on the cloud? Correct. And there's a lot of benefits coming when we get there. And, and, and there's going to be a, a, a lot of education. I mean, I, I, I think, and, but I think of all these these online tax companies uh, that are doing taxes as we speak right now. Yeah. I mean, if it's online, I think we could be so much more efficient. I think it'd be serve the customer so much more. That's why I'm pressing this issue. I, I just look at customer service in today's world. Uh, when you're on the cloud, there's so many benefits, uh, and, and we see that in the private sector. And that's why I, I, I really push this. And, and just finally with that, I mean, 
what, what goes along with this, right? Once we get to a cloud-based system, then we can also do more with AI. We talked about that, Domeni, I was talking about it earlier. Uh, can you discuss uh, how you're using more AI uh, for, for assistant and enforcement? And what does that look forward? Uh, how can we look forward to using that when we get to a cloud system? I'll start by saying we're being uh, very careful with our deployment of AI, making sure that we're following the right ethics and ensuring, that, as was mentioned earlier in this hearing, that no bias would be introduced. So we're, we're, do, we're doing it very methodically. Here is a couple of the key places where we're do, introducing AI. First, in our call center, so that we are kind of using, um, uh, for example, chat bots, so that when you're asking a question before you get to a live assister, they're using language recognition to answer your question. And then you resolve the question, yep. and then they're done, and they're done more quickly. Yep. So that's one example. Also, in going back to this point of making sure that we're selecting the right cases for audit, gotcha. there's very sophisticated modeling uh, that uses advanced math, advanced data science, that means that we're more likely to pull a case where there's evasion versus not. That means the honest taxpayer doesn't get burdened, right. and that means the dishonest taxpayer gets yeah. accountability. That sounds great. And, and again, I'm just pressuring as much as possible to, to modernize. I mean, this is, uh, it should be you know, 20 years in the coming that, that this all happens, and hopefully we can get it done in the next 12 months. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Morris, recognized. Thank you, Chairman. Commissioner, thanks for being here. Um, we're getting down to the, the, the lower dais, down to the, the, the last little bit. This is where the real work gets done. It, it is. And this is where we actually solve problems. And We're just getting um, started. Yeah, just getting started. No, sincerely, uh, I, 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 I represent Ogden, Utah. I know. Right. Uh, wonderfully strong workforce for the IRS. Uh, it's been, you know, I've known it my whole life. and have many colleagues and friends and everybody that, that have been there. I visited there as a member of Congress. I actually look at my time before Congress when I was a management consultant. And, and if I, I actually wish that I could be working on this project in that sphere instead of even in a, in a, in a congressional role because it, it, to me it would be very simple. You have, you have a, a bipartisan, strong agreement about modernization. And my colleague from Iowa just spoke a lot to it, so I won't rehash too much of it, but there's commitment there. And we should be doubling down, we should be tripling our efforts to make this happen. And at that point, we then assess what workforce needs are. Right? And I, so I, I opposed um, the Democrats' bill, IRA, that would have done a huge expansion. But then when we pulled it back, we wanted to keep the focus on the modernization piece. And then we, we, we reassess and we try to go about figuring out where the workforce needs to be. And, and, and that's the way I, I hope we can continue forward, um, realizing, finding the areas of common ground, because that's the only time you get anything done in this place, is if there's common ground and we make moves in the right direction. My constituents, uh, this is a pain point for them. Yeah. Your offices, um, they, we share the same federal building. Uh, when, when we reach out, we, do a, we have an excellent relationship. So thank you again for that, and I echo what my friend from Georgia said, but this is an area we can actually improve on and we need to double down on those efforts. Um, so thanks for the comments you made on modernization and, and digitizing and getting this to, to that point. Uh, members of this committee you know, have raised many important points on that. Uh, can you discuss how the agency is truly prioritizing these initiatives? What is immediately something you're immediately working on, something that you, you want to get accomplished that, that might be a, a few months to years down the road, but you could probably, you know, we could maybe make it happen quicker if you get more collaboration from us. Um, concerned about the level of attention the IRS has placed on programs like the direct e-file program, which was not authorized by Congress. Could you give some, share some thoughts on that? Yeah, in terms of, uh, you know, we want to have big impact for taxpayers that benefit them. And so, you know, I start with the call center. Um, this is a place where there uh, has been historic uh, attention. I think a lot of taxpayers end up uh, uh, co coming to the call center, uh, hoping for a smooth and better experience. Uh, I think we, uh, the call center certainly faltered in the 2022 uh, tax season. Uh, and the changes we can make is not just about hiring additional phone assisters, it's about modernizing our call center. Because you, you look at call centers in other industries and around uh, and, and in other public sector organizations, there are 
uh, both AI and technology solutions that can make the whole operation operate more smoothly. And then I go to our, our, our web tools. We have uh, uh, online accounts now where individuals and businesses can register and have their own personal account with the IRS. And so think about it in terms of what that account functionality is today versus your experience with your online bank account. And we have a gap. There are certain things you can do with the IRS online account, but not nearly as much as you can do with your favorite uh, bank online account. And the goal is to close that gap. Now, that is not just about fixing the website. There's the entire technology uh, infrastructure underneath that that also has to enable a more modern experience for taxpayers. That's where the focus should be. I think there should be a bipartisan agreement that we want to lean in to give taxpayers the tools to make this entire taxpaying process easier. Excellent, I agree, and I, and I believe that, that that motivation is there and we need to, we need to double those efforts. Um, regarding the employee retention tax credit, you saw the tax package that this committee just came together on to pass in overwhelming fashion. Can you give me a sense, um, I've heard from a lot of small businesses that are anxiously awaiting for their ERTC claims to be processed. How is the IRS working with reputable tax preparers in the greater tax community to ensure that these ERTC payments continue to be processed, the legitimate ones and, and everything? There, there's a big backlog here. There is, there is. Um, I, my, my, I get the, this question a lot. Work with your taxpayer, the taxpayer advocate. If you have a hardship, we're working with the taxpayer advocate to try to prioritize our significant uh, inventory to those that face the, the, the biggest hardships. It's an unfortunate situation. The, the, the promoters and the marketers that uh, essentially tricked a lot of small businesses that weren't eligible into applying have clogged, have the, clogged system. the system. And, and we're working through it. I mentioned we're, co we're coming up on nearly a billion dollars in ERC issuances that have occurred since we announced the moratorium. And most of that is working with the taxpayer advocate and Congress and others to prioritize those that are the most urgent because they're hardship cases. That doesn't mean they're, they're gonna get approved because sometimes we work on it, we realize you're actually not eligible, but we're focused on it and we're making sure they get resolution. I got a request earlier today, so I may even be calling in myself. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Moore. I don't believe the top dais would agree with your inaccurate statements earlier. Mr. Gomez. Mr. Chairman. <laughs> yes. That's unanimous. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Commissioner Wolfold. Thank you for being here today. I call the lowest, the lower part of the dais, the part of the dais that's closest to the people. So, uh, um, and I'm proud that we are all here are fighting for our constituents. Um, I want to talk about the child tax credit. Um, in 2021, we saw child poverty cut by nearly half in a single year thanks to the child tax credit. By increasing the credit, making it fully refundable, and authorizing monthly payments, we use the tax code to deliver relief directly to American families. Three million children were lifted out of poverty. But despite our policies giving working and middle class Americans more money in their, po uh, in their pockets, which all my Republican colleagues claim is their goal, every Republican Congress let these vital provisions expire. We did see some progress from Republicans last month when we passed a bipartisan package to strengthen the CTC. But ultimately, Republicans refused to support the provisions that have been proven to dramatically reduce child poverty. Provisions like increasing the maximum credit and ensuring a full refundability to help kids and families who need the credit the most. But I want to focus on an equally important but often overlooked provision that made the CTC so effective monthly checks. Parents know kids need diapers, formula, food, clothes, and they need it not um, once a year, but they need it every single day, every single week, and every single month. You can't pay down your child's hunger once at the end of each year. By giving families the money they are entitled to in monthly payments, uh, we boosted monthly income and put their money back in their pockets. Making payments monthly instead of annual has the power to change the lives of working people all over the country. That sounds like something the Republicans should support if you listen to what they want from the tax code. Commissioner, given the progress made and lessons learned in 2021, does the IRS already have much of the infrastructure and knowledge to quickly roll out advanced payments of the child tax credit if Congress acts? It certainly was a, a beneficial moment for us to re-engineer our systems, 
update our processes and go through the effort and resolve it successfully, I, I like to say we now have the muscle memory and should be able to implement something like that uh, easier than if we were trying it for the first time. I appreciate that. And one of the things that I was uh, informed about is that it also wouldn't cost that much. So um, it's something that I know would make a difference. You know, some people say it's only 250 to 500 or even 700 bucks a month, but to working people, that is a lot of money that Absolutely. can make a difference when it comes to making basic ends meet. Um, and then another aspect of making the child tax credit effective is ensuring that taxpayers claiming the credit are treated equitably. Um, last year, I wrote a letter requesting the IRS to further analyze and report existing data by race and gender to help us better understand how other historically marginalized communities may be impacted by racial disparities in, the, uh, in audit selection. I appreciate your leadership announcing that the IRS is taking meaningful steps to address these disparities, especially, especially for refundable credits like the EITC and the CTC. Commissioner, can you please update us on this work, including any information about the case selection practices driving these disparities and steps being taken to address the, uh, the, the disparities I just mentioned? Yes, the, the big uh, uh, takeaways you should have are the following. One, we are significantly reducing the number of EITC audits because audit volume was identified in the independent report as being one of the main drivers of disparate impact. Second, we have changed the case selection algorithm with an intent specifically uh, to reduce uh, the disparities that were existing in our case selection. Uh, we'll be able to report in the fall of 24 timeframe uh, whether the uh, changes that we made are having the intended impact of eliminating the disparity. Furthermore, we now want to work to make sure that we are constantly uh, evaluating uh, disparate impact in IRS operations, and we're working on uh, the best way to do that. And in particular, it's often important to work with external stakeholders. This, uh, this whole issue surfaced by an independent report. Uh, so partnering with various stakeholders who can evaluate the impact of IRS operations along with us is critical. So strengthening those partnerships is another part of the plan. Thank you, Commissioner. When um, Chairman Neal established the, the racial uh, economic uh, equity working group when we were uh, in the majority, it's an issue that we feel is important because if Americans feel like the tax system is fair, they're more likely to comply. So with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Ms. Maliotakis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Commissioner. Thank you for your time here today. My colleagues have asked a, a wide range of questions and concerns, uh, but today I really want to talk about the casework in my district office um, we're faced with on a regular basis. Um, first, I want to commend your team of tax advocates. In particular, um, George Agite has worked very closely with my district office. He's a tremendous asset, does a fantastic job. And it is my understanding that the New York delegation has a total of 1,688 open cases with the IRS, 81 of those being from my office. The number one issue uh, my office deals with, unfortunately, is stolen returns. Mm. Um, I believe we have 14 current cases with the IRS totaling uh, over $1 million in stolen returns where criminals have removed and replaced the name and the address on the check. And theft is made easy uh, by the envelopes that the Department of Treasury uses, making it blatantly obviously, obvious that there's a check inside. Mm. The issue worsens when the IRS does not allow those individuals to then opt for a direct deposit, so a new check gets issued and we are in this kind of endless cycle with one of my constituents having a check needed to be replaced three times. It is also my understanding that the IRS does not allow direct deposits for amounts over 20,000 um, or 25,000. So I, I, I understand that these thefts are not solely confined to IRS checks, but every check issued by the Department of Treasury. So I just had a few questions on how, you know, we can possibly work together to rectify this issue and what is the theft in Check, first, do you know the cost of what this is uh, costing the United States taxpayers, the fact that uh, these checks are being stolen? I don't have a metric on that. Um, I do think you have identified the right set of, uh, of people to come together. Me, um, the, uh, the head of the Bureau of Fiscal Service at Treasury that operates our, our payment platforms, either sends the checks or executes the direct deposit. Um, and I do have, uh, 
a lot of motivation around these open cases. I mean, I, I've referenced it a few times, the Taxpayer Bill of Rights uh, affords the taxpayer quick resolution. And if they're waiting and having to receive a check three times, then we're not meeting that, that responsibility. On the issue of tackling the theft itself, are you working with the U.S. Postal Service to try to address this issue? I'm not aware that we are, but I want to get back to you on that. Okay. And um, since the issue is for all Treasury issued checks, has, has anyone discussed the changing the envelope to, so it's not so obvious that there's a check? It, it's, it's, as you're sitting here saying this, it's very intuitive, but I do want to check with the Bureau of Fiscal Service leadership on this. Um, what options do you think are available to constituents that are victims of this tax return theft other than getting a reissued paper check? And, and is uh, revisiting the, the direct deposit issue uh, can, you, can you do that in terms yes, of... Yes, I want to look into why that is yeah. not uh, currently feasible. Yeah, it should be an option, certainly, if they had the first check stolen, they want to move to direct yes. deposit, that should be an option. And then if you could look at the thresholds, if, if there is truly a, a cutoff at twenty twenty five thousand dollars $25,000, which I had not heard about prior. So, look, I, I really want to work with you on this issue. Absolutely. Um, I, I really hope that you'll follow up uh, your staff with my team so we can try to get to the bottom of this and maybe there's a follow-up meeting that we can have with somebody from Treasury to really discuss this because if it's a million dollars that's being stolen from constituents in my district, there's 435 members, right? And so we, we that's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. So we want to try to get to the bottom of this and unfortunately there are bad people in the world that are trying to take advantage of our uh, constituents and the American taxpayer. Uh, and we've got to, I guess, modernize our system to keep up with this type of fraud. It's the smart place to make investments where people are being victimized is the exact place where the government needs to step in and prevent and be helpful. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Mr. Kerry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and the ranking member. I'm reminded of that phrase, where you are now, I once was then. Um, and I do appreciate uh, the comments uh, and the, uh, the leadership uh, that, that, is, is, that, that is behind me. Um, just want to say that because I'm number 25 on this dais here. Yes. Um, I do want to talk a couple of issues that I'm going to start with because uh, I think one is important to the future of our country, which is digital asset brokers. Mm. Uh, but then I also want to talk about what I think is preserving the history of our country. It's the conversation that you and I had uh, the last time you were here, Commissioner, which is historic tax credits and historic preservation easements. Yes. So to give you just a minute to, to think about those things, I would also like to ec echo the comments from my colleague from Illinois as it relates to child support, because that, that October 24th deadline is, is, is looming, and uh, would like, our office will work with you on that. Also would like to follow up with, uh, um, I, I heard uh, my colleague from Georgia say that you were very helpful in some constituent cases that, that he had. Uh, I'll probably revisit you with that. So with that, Commissioner, I trust you're familiar with the uh, recent release proposed rule regarding tax reporting requirements for digital asset brokers. Yes, I am. So then you know that the rule is finalized as currently proposed. The IRS, by their own admissions, will receive an estimated $8 billion information returns from just this one rule. So to put that in perspective, for 2022, the IRS received $5.45 billion information returns total. With this new proposed rule, the amount of the reports the IRS will receive will increase by about 150%. We are talking about the amount of employees you have. Is the IRS equipped to handle this significant increase in the data? And there's a lot of moving pieces on, uh, on these issues. Uh, we've issued the proposed regulations. Uh, we've got hundreds of thousands of comments in that we're working through. I feel like we're at an inflection point uh, in terms of uh, digital currency and how to approach it along a lot of different perspectives of government, but in particular, tax. Um, we have to be uh, prepared to whatever the outcome of that regulatory process is, to have the technology and the process to uh, execute those regulations fulsomely. So we will only propose in final regulations things that we have confidence we can execute on. And I thank you for that. Personally, I support amending the rule to ensure that there is parity between the traditional finance industry. And I understand these rules go beyond the traditional what traditional finance requires. If the rule did create a more level playing field between the two, 
the number of reportable transactions would decrease, freeing up IRS's time to focus on their current mission and not shifting all through the unnecessary data. Um, probably looks like I'm not going to get to historic preservation, but, but uh, we'll follow up in written testimony on that. Um, what timeline of implementing the recently released proposed rule regarding tax reporting requirements and assets for brokers do you think it would, do you think that it's a realistic time frame? Uh, that the challenge that I have is that I, uh, it's really uh, my counterparts at Treasury that, uh, that, uh, that I co-lead this with. And so I would want to make sure that we're aligned on the time frame. I think, I, I think we got over 400,000 400, comments on the regulation. And so figuring out, you know, this is, this is a complicated issue, and we certainly don't want to get out in front before we've uh, given those, uh, those comments fair, uh, fair vetting. So I don't have a specific date for you, but I can work with Treasury to get you one. And, I, and I'd appreciate that. Uh, now, it's my understanding uh, that there's a much shorter window for compliance than traditional finance brokers. And to comply when they were implementing this rule, for the, the traditional would being five years, the digital asset exchanges only got 16 months. Is there any reason for that? Uh, I don't, at, at my fingertips, have the, the full explanation and basis for it, but we will give you the underlying uh, basis for that. Well, and I, and I appreciate that again, Mr. Uh, the, the Commissioner. Uh, given, given this new industry, it's a new industry with new technologies and innovation, I would recommend that you reevaluate the timeline to give the stakeholders enough time to comply, uh, just as the traditional financial market did. Um, we are voting, and uh, I will get back okay. with you on the historic pre tax credits and historic preservation easements because they're very important to me. Um, but I do appreciate your time, and it's good to see you again. Thank you. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Werfel, for appearing before us today. We look forward to the follow-up answers from um, the request of our members. Please be advised that members have two weeks to submit written questions to be answered later in writing. Those questions and your answers will be made part of the formal hearing uh, record today. With that, the committee stands adjourned.